we go. So before we get started, just a couple of announcements. Um, they change, if you can actually, how many people are actually able to get in remotely? Anybody being successful? Wait, it's time. Time. Okay. So they changed the remote access is now fully available on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays during the day, theoretically, uh, because there aren't any classes in here during the day. Um, just to remind you, the computer lab, this lab is open till like from eight in the morning till nine at night, Monday through Thursday till five on Fridays. Not open on the weekend unless you happen to be in the school of ed, in which case you can actually get your key card so that you can get into the building and get into the lab. But if you're outside the school of ed, I don't know that there's any way to do anything about that. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I can report about this already, but just so you're aware, sometimes it connects into a machine that someone else is using already, and you can't like, get a new reservation. It connects into a machine somebody else is already yeah. using? Yeah. No yeah. matter what you do, you can't. Well, that explains actually why people are having so much trouble. Well, like, they have a deal. It, it gives this really scary message, too, that it's like if you don't do something in 30 seconds, you're going to be completely booted out. So you have to like take those 30 seconds to like, save everything, and then you're like denying the other person coming in. <laughs> It, it also, it seems like if someone logs into the computer, it pulls you out, too. Well, that's, that's what, what I was going to say. That would kind of make sense, right? When somebody tries to log into your remote desktop, that probably screws everything up. Are yeah. you sure they don't have a deal with Unplus? Because some of us just went ahead and bought it. It's not even too complicated. I feel like they have a deal with Unplus. No, they don't have a deal with Unplus. <laughs> I promise you they don't. This is what I will say. Up until 2020, when the when fall of 2020, when the last time I taught this class, we never tried to do remote desktop. And in fall of 2020, we sort of had to because some people weren't on campus at all, right? People could take the class hybridly. It wasn't as bad as this. It, it was bad the first couple of weeks, but it did work itself out, didn't it, Jocelyn? But of course, Jameson was here and he's gone now, so that's probably part of the problem. Um, and there are probably new people at UITS because UITS sets it all up. But prior to that, you know, there was no remote access. You just had to come and do your homework in the lab. And I would just say, like, that's probably your, I mean, I don't want to be discouraging about the remote access, but the lab, you know that that plus is going to work remotely. Eh, you know, kind of taking your chances. Yeah, buying it is always an option, although that's an expensive option. So I feel like you shouldn't have to do that. But I know that a couple people in here have done that. So, I mean, that's. That certainly that certainly works too. But uh, so anyway, I keep I keep emailing Corey. I have no I have no solutions. UITS knows it's suboptimal. He told me they're going to build a whole different system that they think is going to work better, but that's not going to be done this semester. So I don't know. I don't hold out a lot of hope for the new system necessarily. We'll see. So that's where we are. But I didn't know the thing about logging into the same, I mean, that's so stupid, right? Like, it seems like if you're a tech guy, that would be, you could figure that one out, not have people <laughs> signing into the same computer, <sighs> whatever. Okay, so I apologize. I don't know what to do about it. Like I said, I think your best bet is, you know, if you can get here, do your homework here. Um, there is a class in here at one o'clock on Wednesdays, but I'm pretty sure that if Wednesday afternoons are the only good time for you to be here, that we could talk to Bianca about you sitting in the back silently working on M+. I'm sure that she would be amenable to that. I know some of you are actually in that class, so maybe that doesn't help you if it's the only day that you come and you're actually in both classes. But I don't know. It's open till 9 at night. That makes for a long Wednesday. I get that. So I apologize. I don't know what to say about this remote access, except to say that my regret is that I ever said that it was an option, <laughs> given how, you know, it sort of reminds me of like behaviorism, right? Like this is like intermittent reinforcement that just makes it all the more frustrating, right? Because you're like, oh, maybe this time it'll work. Maybe this time it'll work. This could be like, maybe that's it. Maybe Brandy, Simonson, and the behaviorism crew are running some kind of sick experiment on all of you in SEM class to see how many times you'll try to go back and promote into the desktop. Yeah, I, that is also true. But anyway, so on that note, uh, oh, I got another couple of announcements. So 
again, remember homework isn't due until tomorrow night at five. Um, uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, you know, I just want to remind you one more time that, you know, in addition to having the, you know, the recordings up, I've also put chapters from the book that I wrote, right? Um, I can't, I mean, I'm not trying to like sell my own book here or anything, but I can't over, I'm not selling it because the PDFs are up there, but I can't overemphasize that like, I talk the way that I write. So if you are confused by something that I say in class, um, a really great resource for you is to go to the book and look and see how I talk about it in the book. Because it's basically kind of like my lecture notes written in a much nicer form. Yeah. I have a small question about that because like a couple homeworks ago we had to do the the R squared for different paths. Uh -huh. and, and and so in your book it talks about you just take the path coefficient and square it. But then in the homework it seems like you can also get it from M plus. So are we actually getting the variance of the path or just the variance of the variable? Because it seems like like, I think that one parental distress at two different paths, and it seemed like we should just put the same value for both. No, no, no. no. Okay, so if I think in the book I talk about the idea that let's say you have a latent variable, right? And then you've got an indicator here, variable one, and you've got error. And so well, I'll just make this point set, right? So what's the proportion of variance in variable one that's explained by the variable? And that's absolutely true that it's 0.7 squared, right? Okay, so that's for a loading, but when it's a path, maybe it's... When it's a path, but what you're saying is something like this, like, well, it, it would also be true if you had something like this, okay? So let's say this is also 0.7, and this is variable one, and this is variable two, and what's the proportion of variance in variable two? That's explained by variable one, it's 0.7 squared, it's 0.49, okay? So as long as you only have one path, you're golden. I mean, just like in simple linear regression, if you want to figure out the R squared and you only have one predictor, it's really easy. You just square the standardized loading and that's the R squared. So this is nothing different from regression. But what is true is, let's say you create, let's say you have another variable, right? And so now you've got two variables and you want to figure out what's the proportion of variance that's explained by these two variables in combination. You cannot, just like you could not, I mean, this again, this is actually just a path diagram of a multiple regression. You could not in multiple regression, nor can you here just say 0.49 squared plus 0.36, you know, not 0.49 squared, you know what I meant, 0.7 squared, which is 0.49, plus 0.6 squared, which is 0 0.36, 0 0.49 plus 0 0.36 equals whatever it equals, if that is not the R squared, right? So you can't, if you have multiple paths, and, and that would be true actually, you know, if you had a second latent variable here, and this actually had a double loading, you know, then you, you also would not be able to just square the, square the, path or pattern coefficients. So basically, what I said is absolutely true. As it, it totally works. You can just square the path or the pattern coefficient as long as there's only one path or pattern coefficient leading into that variable. But as soon as you have multiple paths or multiple pattern coefficients leading into that variable, then again, just like multiple regression, you, 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 you know, it's not just a simple adding these, you know, adding these squared paths up. So the easiest way to get that, and we talked about conceptually, what you can say is, or what you can do, this actually, not, right? So this is actually the unexplained variance, right? And we're not estimating it as a parameter in the model, but there is some total variance in, in variable two. So we can take, the unexplained variance, which is this, right? So that's basically the variance in the disturbance. And we can divide that by the total variance 
right? And that's going to give us, not actually going to give us r squared, because this is the unexplained variance. It's going to give us 1 minus r squared, right? But if you know 1 minus r squared, then 1 minus 1 minus r squared is actually r squared. And so, right, so 1 minus 1 minus r squared equals r squared. So conceptually, this is how we can actually get the proportion of variance that's explained in any endogenous variable. It's basically by saying, okay, well, what proportion of variance in this endogenous is not explained? Okay, take that, create a ratio of that to the total variance in that variable. That gives, that gives us the, or sorry, how much is not explained? Divide that by the total variance in the endogenous variable. That gives us the proportion of unexplained variance. And once I have the proportion of unexplained variance, it's super easy to get the proportion of uh, explained variance. And okay. said that, the easiest way for you to get it on homeworks, et cetera, et cetera, is to go to M plus, right? Which will give you R squared measures for all endogenous variables. So you don't actually have to do any of this on like a daily basis, but conceptually, this is sort of the way we think about it. Yeah. Okay, so I think- Does that help? It was, and I think the conceptually really kind of, because you were like, as a material, I thought you- Variance, but it's not like variance is always in the variable, which I should have clicked on maybe earlier. It's dependent, the, uh, yeah. Okay, so we're just always going to be talking about the. I always get mixed up now because I'm totally different than this in my head, but the variable that is being predicted. Being predicted. We're that's going to put that R squared. That, that's right. That's right. And again, that, that really is exactly like regression. You know, anytime we run a regression, we're always asking, we're always asking what, how much of the variance or what proportion of the variance in the variable I'm predicting can I explain with all of my predictors, right? And yeah. Well, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, the proportion of variance explained by each predictor. No well, I mean, you can. I mean, again, it's very much like, you know, so your standardized path coefficient is giving you, you know, it's giving you information like that, right? So this is really, this is really the independent contribution it's not it's not a proportion of variance because it's not in a squared metric right but it's it's like a uh it's like a semi-partial you know kind of correlation type thing so if you really wanted to you could figure out what is the independent you know what is the proportion of variance that's independently explained by this predictor the easiest way to do that you know if you don't want to like sit down and with a pen and paper and all that kind of stuff the easiest way to do that is actually to fit the model without that path, right? And look at the R squared in the endogenous variable, then put that path in, look at the R squared with that path in, and then subtract out those R squareds, which again is very much like what you do when you're doing like sequential regression, right? So then you can say, okay, well, before I put in this path, I and, and this is actually a good idea in general, like even when you're thinking about uh, and we talked about tests of deleted paths. You know, we've relied on statistical significance testing, but I said, you know, you shouldn't just be a slave to 0.05. You should also be looking at like what proportion of the variance in the endogenous variable is this, you know, path I think I don't need. How much is that explaining? And, and that's how you can get at that. The easiest way is run the model without the path, take the R squared, right? Put it on a piece of paper, run the model with the path take the R squared, put it on a piece of paper, subtract out those R squares, and the difference between those R squares is the independent contribution of that path to that, to the, you know, to explaining that endogenous variable. Does that make sense? But again, this is all stuff you would have done in regression. Everything, just about everything, I'm always afraid of saying everything, so I'll, I'll hedge a little bit, but basically everything you've done in regression is going to hold true here. Right, this is like a really like hyped up regression analyses with latent variables and right multiple, you know, much more much more complex sort of network of paths. But but you know the same basic tenets of this is all built on regression, right? I mean the same basic tenets hold true. Question? Yes. One more thing. Okay. So we feel them. Um, so another question I kind of had is uh, because it seems like we're 
um, getting more and more ways to like like confirm all this, for example, we have fit in disease versus before we were just relying on tri-squared difference tests. Mm -hmm. Are we adding to the toolbox or are we replacing the tri-squared difference test? Adding to the toolbox. That's a good clarification. So, you know, the, again, I, we talked about last week that one of the biggest downsides of chi-square in general and the chi-square difference test is that chi-square is so strongly a function of sample size. And so that's why we have to be a little bit wary of the chi-square difference test in very large samples, especially. But like when you have moderate sized samples, chi-square chi difference tests actually work really pretty well. But if you have very large samples, then the chi-square difference test can, can be problematic. And I gave the example of uh, Tamika LaSalle, who's got these data files that have hundreds of thousands of kids in them, right? And we'll do these chi-square difference tests. And, you know, like the chi-square difference will be like 2,000. But when you look at it, like, you know, like, the proportion of variance explained by that path might be like point oh one, you know. I mean, like it's nothing, right? It's nothing. But you know, but but her original chi square is like thirteen million, you know. So that's another thing that, and and I didn't say this, but it's something that I do when I look at chi square and chi square difference. I look at the actual how big is the chi square to begin with, right? So like if my chi square is hundred, and when I add this parameter, the chi-square drops by 20. Not only is that clearly statistically significant, but a chi-square drop of 20 is like, wow, I mean, I'm going from 100 to 80, right? That's like, you know, 20% of my original chi-square value. I've re it reduced by like 20%, right? That's a lot. On the other hand, if my original chi-square is 10,000 and by adding this path, I reduce the chi-square by 20. Like, yeah, okay, it's still statistically significant because 3.84 is still the magic number, but now, like, it's a drop in the proverbial chi-square bucket to be reducing my chi-square by 20 if my original chi-square is like 10,000, right? So it's like 10,000 and it goes to like 9,980. You see what I mean? So. I think, I mean, again, I think that's why we have to be careful about just being total slaves to like, you know, above 3.84, important, right? Like, you know, below 3.84, nothing. But, um, and we need to sort of think about it more globally, but I would not throw out chi-square as one of your tools. I think I spend a lot of time looking at chi-square. I'm just, I'm just a little more nuanced in the way I think about it rather than just sort of saying like, there is this, you know, right? There's this one like line in the sand and that's it. And I'm not going to think any more deeply. That's what I don't want you to do. Yeah. So if your chi square is super significant of the fit indices, do you think it would be good model? Can you still move forward with that? Model? Yeah. Yeah. And that happens again, where you'll see that happen pretty consistently is if you have a very, very large sample size. Because with a very, very large sample size, remember the chi-square is a function of that f times the sample size minus one. So if you have a really, really large sample size, um, it, it is not uncommon to see a really large chi-square in conjunction with really good fit indices. And that's why people moved away from just looking at the chi-square to determine whether a model was a good fitting model. Right, because because so often people were going out and getting really big sample sizes because this is a large sample technique. So you really the bigger the sample size, the better in terms of actually estimating these models. So you don't want to be thinking, oh, I shouldn't get a big sample size. So people, but you feel like, but you get penalized for that with the chi square, and that's really where all of these fit indices came from. And you'll remember that most of them are a function of the chi square. Right? It was people saying, okay, how can we come up with a metric that still relies on the chi-square in some fashion, but also like doesn't actually penalize people for having huge samples? And then also they discovered that some of the, you know, that that maybe, maybe also the number of degrees of freedom you have or the number of parameters you have, the number of variables you have, those things might also make a difference in terms of in terms of how chi-square performs. And so the goal was to come up with fit indices that would be more um, invariant to those things, right? That wouldn't be just overly influenced by 
sample size or model size, number of parameters, number of variables, number of degrees of freedom, those kinds of things. But yeah. Um, but you know, but I think chi square is still a useful metric to look at. And it's always going to go down as you get a more complex model, it's always going to go up as you get a more parsimonious model. So it's still a good sort of pointer, right? I mean, it still, still gives you some good information about model performance. Any other question? I have a question about the S3 DY. Um, mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering then if you have a binary, um, binary covariate, then um, you should use the SPDY uh, estimates just for the path that goes off from um, the binary covariate to others, and you should use the STDYX for other paths, or we should use um, um, STDY estimates for all of the paths, then we have binary covariates in our model. Yeah, I would just use the, I would use the STDY paths for all of the binary covariate, I mean, sorry, all of the parameters in the model. So the STDY, um, is really, well, actually, maybe I'll, yeah, I think about that. STDYX. Yeah. You should be okay using the STDY for everything. It shouldn't make too much of a difference. But the STD, so the, the really, but the most important, I don't, it's not going to matter. I don't think it would matter much for the continuous to continuous. It's an interesting question. But where it's really going to matter is the dichotomous to the continuous. Because what the STDY is going to do is not standardize your dichotomous independent variables. So if you have, by the way, that's not true if it's an endogenous variable necessarily, but um, that things get more complex if you have a, uh, an endogenous dichotomous variable, an endogenous categorical variable. But with STDY, if you have something like gender, let's say, so you've got a zero one variable. If you use STDYX, which would be like a, I think of STDYX as like a fully standardized solution. So every variable is going to, every variable is going to be standardized, whether it's dichotomous or continuous. With STDY, if you have a dichotomous variable, a dichotomous independent variable, it's not, it's not, you're not going to standardize that. So the way that you would actually interpret that would be like the change in Y standardized units when X changes by one unit. So actually, I'm going to say, now I kind of want to mess with that. Because I think STDY or STDYX should be fine if you have continuous, continuous combinations. But the proof is in the pudding, right? If they don't look the same, then I would be worried. Did you look? Do they look the same? Um, the, actually, there are some, some minor differences between the estimates, but the difference was this I mean, very small. Yeah, I was going to say, if they're like super minor, I would sort of expect yeah, to see actually, that. Um, there was the same question on the NPLOS website, and um, Dr. Malton answered it, but um, the answer was very short, and she just says that use SPD bias unless the covariance is binary. Um, but it doesn't... It doesn't say for the whole model versus for... I mean, I honestly don't think it's going to... I'll play around with it after class, but I don't think it's going to matter in the continuous, continuous case. Where it's really going to matter is if you have a binary dichotomous variable predicting a continuous variable, and in that case, you don't want to use STDYX. And that was kind of the that was kind of the point that I was making with the homework because because then you don't want to standardize a binary variable. That seems really weird, right? So that's what we're trying to avoid is avoiding standardizing binary variables. So whenever we have uh, binary variables um, in our model, we should use STDY in all of our models, I mean, measurement model or the next step, just an identified conceptual model in all of them, or just after we are done with the measurement part, with the measurement model? Um, well, yeah, with the measurement model, it wouldn't matter, right? 
because if it's a dichotomous variable that isn't part of a factor, then it's just going to be correlated with all of the other variables, right? So in the measurement model, there is no path. You would just be getting the correlation between this binary variable and these other variables. So it's not an issue in the, in the measurement model at all. So you don't have to worry about it at all in the measurement model. Where it's really going to matter is in the structural model. And again, like, I mean, I mean, if you use STD, I mean, sometimes people do. Sometimes they use the STDYX for everything. I mean, people do do that. But it's weird to interpret that because then your interpretation is for a standard deviation increase in, uh, you know, in gender, right? Like you would, right? Yeah, I see. You. Like I would expect a corresponding, at, you know, this many standard deviation unit increase in whatever your endogenous variable is, and that's really weird. We don't, we don't think that way, right? It's much, much more, it's much more natural to think about for a one unit increase in this binary variable, which means you're going from male to female, right? How much change do we see, right, in the in the dependent variable? And so that's, so I guess I would say, I don't, on bottom line, there would be nothing wrong with using STDYX for all of the continuous and STDY for the dichotomous. But the most important, I think you'd be fine using STDY for everything as well. Yeah, I wanted to ask you this. <laughs> yeah, and in terms of the homework, you're fine either way. So in terms of the homework, I wouldn't worry about it. The most, but the most important thing is using STDY when you have dichotomous independent variables for those paths because they're really uninterpretable otherwise, right? So for the, for the purposes of the homework, the most important thing is to use the STDY to, for the dichotomous predictor, which I forget is what it is. Status, Status right? So for any, of the, for any of the interpretations that involve status, you want to make sure that you're using the standardized, that's the STDY. For the others, I really don't think it's going to matter whether you use STDY or STDYX, if it's a continuous to continuous path. I think, I think, I will go back and double check after class, I think you will get virtually, maybe not exactly, but essentially the same answer either way. Does that make sense? Okay. I have another question. Sure. About, um, using the unexplained variance to get to the uh -huh. explained variance. Um, you can use the same um, thing for for the measurement errors as well, right? Whenever we have um, more than one factor. Totally. Yeah. This is true for any kind of endogenous variable, whether it's in the measurement model or the structural model. Anytime you have, you know, multiple predictors, multiple pathways. You know, you're going to have the same problem, and you can always use the same same strategy. One last question. Sure. Um, um, in prior classes, we, we said that um, if we want to have our model very complete, we, we have one um, in, in the path from disturbance to variance. I mean, um, the, the coefficient, uh, the coefficient oh, yeah, yeah. the path. It's one. one. Mm -hmm. is one. Yeah. I was wondering if, if it's the same for the path that goes from um, the, the measurement error to the indicator? Yes. Okay. So in both cases, anytime you have a residual, whether it's a disturbance or a measurement error, you know, we're drawing a path here, but we're not actually estimating a path there. We're actually constraining that path to be one, and we're estimating the variance. And the reality is you actually could do either, you can't do both. So there's another whole way that you can, um, there's another whole way that you can specify models where you estimate the path and you constrain the disturbance variance to be, so like that, um, you like constrain the disturbance variance to be one and you estimate the path. Again, those, type, those actually end up being mathematically equivalent models. So you can then still get wherever you wanna go but it, that, and that's actually the way that people often specify path analytic models at sort of long, long ago. Um, but this tends to be a nicer specification. 
uh, than that. I think that it's a little more convoluted. You have to actually, like, it's not so easy, I don't think, to think that way. Um, and so this, I mean, I, I think the specification where we, and again, this will be the default in any SEM program, where we, we're constraining this path to P1, we're estimating the variance. And that's always true for all kinds of residuals, be they, be they disturbances or be they measurement errors. And that's why we never count those paths, because they're not freely estimated, they're constrained. And there would be no way to actually estimate that path and estimate the variance. You'd be under identified. It's not possible. Yeah? All right. Any other questions? All right. Good, good, good. So now let's talk about mediation and bootstrapping. Yay. I am recording. So you're not going to slug through all the questions. Get to the recording. What? Which is you don't have this. Oh, they're not on Husky? There's a. No, there are, there are there some other slides, but not this one. Yeah, there's, there a, there's a spot for it, but there's nothing attached to it. Yeah. It has like a title, but there's no file. Yeah. That's really weird. Well, huh. Huh. Okay. Well, during the, uh, you don't have access to them, do you, Jocelyn? Mm -hmm. I can't. Uh, yeah, they're not very different from last year's. Oh yeah, can you go into Husky CT and find last year's and just plunk them in that spot? That would be great. Yeah, they're almost identical. That's really weird. Uh, during the break, I can put them up, but I would have sworn I'd put them up, so that's really strange. Okay. All right. In the meantime, mediation and bootstrapping. So how many of you have talked about mediation in other classes? Helpful for me to, okay. So most of you. So. Uh, I'm going to do a review of mediation, some sort of basics of mediation, and then we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about how to fit mediation models in M plus, um, I mean in SEM in general. And one of the really important sort of concepts that we're going to bring in this time is bootstrapping, and we're going to talk about why when we have mediational models, it's going to be really important uh, to actually bootstrap. So I don't want to get ahead of myself. Okay, so here's a nice little mediation model. All right, so I'm going to go relatively quickly through the first several slides that are kind of a review of mediation. Um, so again, a mediator is just a variable that explains the relationship between a predictor and an outcome. And by the way, there's a classic article on mediation and moderation in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology from old now, 1986, by Barrett and Kenny that's been cited literally over 100,000 times. Um, that sort of what, you know, sort of set the stage for so much of the work that came, that came afterward. Having said that, um, Baron and Kenny set up a four-step process for thinking about mediation and how to test mediators, which made a lot of sense in 1986, but is now, um, now there are some newer recommendations, so we're going to talk about what the Barron and Kenny four-step procedure is, and then we're going to talk about sort of the newer ways that they, people think about mediation um, as well. Okay, so, you know, here, why is the mediator, right? So the idea is that why, at least, you know, why explains this relationship between X and Z? So you can sort of think like, okay, X predicts Y, and Y predicts Z, right? So maybe this is... Maybe this is an intervention. Let's say X is an intervention. Let's say that um, Z is achievement. And let's say that Y is um, motivation and self-regulation, right? So the intervention is designed to help increase achievement. But the way that it does that is by actually helping kids to develop their self-regulation, like to develop self-regulation strategies, let's say. And so, um, so the intervention actually, ideally, right, this would be the theory, the intervention is going to increase students' motivation, and then students with increased motivation are going to do better in school. And the idea, you know, if there's no direct effect here, right, if this path were actually zero, that would be saying that, you know, after controlling for the level of motivation, the intervention doesn't actually explain achievement, right? So that would sort of mean that all of the variants 
that the intervention and the and achievement share is shared in common with motivation. Does that kind of make sense? So mediation is really about like how or why is there a relationship between a predictor and an outcome variable. And so usually mediational models kind of come after uh, you know, after we've already established a strong relationship between the predictor and the outcome. So often, like in the beginning stages of a line of research, we sort of, you know, we want to see that the intervention works, right? And then maybe later on, we want to know, well, what are the components? Like, why does the intervention work? What is that? What is that pathway by which the intervention works? It's great to know that this intervention increases achievement, but, you know, can I, can I drill down and understand why is it increasing achievement? Um, so that's really when we start to dig into mediation models, usually. Okay, so, so again, mathematically, we're just really thinking about, you know, we're gonna, with a simple three variable model, we're just really thinking about covariance relationships among three variables, this independent variable, this potential mediating variable, and a dependent variable. And the, the first question is like, does that mediating variable actually explain or account for a decent amount of the shared variance between the independent variable and the dependent variable, right? And so you could sort of imagine, again, let's look at our really simple picture here. You know, if this path from X to Y is zero, let's say, what would that mean? That would mean the independent variable doesn't predict the mediator. Right, see, no, no mediation there, right? There's no, there's no prediction. So, so, you know, maybe the intervention does increase achievement, but the intervention doesn't actually increase motivation. So the pathway by which it's increasing achievement is something else. Still a good intervention, but I don't know the why. I have not like, you know, motivation is not the why behind it, right? So, so that's the A path. Like, is there, the, is there this relationship between, and if you think about it, Again, if you sort of look at this, the relationship between X and Y there is just a simple bivariate relationship. We're not controlling, I mean, again, you could have big, you could have mediation in much bigger models, but in this model, we're not controlling for anything else right now, right? So this would just be like, this would be the, this would be the uh, regression coefficient that you would get from just a simple regression of, right? You know, you regress Y on X, okay. Then we have this B path and this C prime path. And now notice that the B path here, now we've got something like a multiple regression where we have X and Y both predicting Z, right? So now the B path is really going to be the effect of Y on Z holding X constant or after controlling for X. And the C prime path is going to be the effect of X on Z holding Y constant. Right or after, um, or after controlling for y. Right, does that make sense? So, so this is really: is there an independent contribution of y on, uh, you know, of y on z after controlling for x? And this is really like: is there an independent contribution of x on z after controlling for y? So, if we think about that in terms of our example, we've got motivation and achievement. And so this would be like, is there, you know, is there an independent contribution of motivation on achievement after controlling for my intervention? And the logical answer would be, yeah, okay, maybe my intervention increases motivation, but it's, you know, right, I'm not going to, uh, yeah, it makes sense that there would be a relationship between motivation and achievement even after controlling for whether you're in the treatment or control group, right? Um, and then this would be saying, okay, well, does, is there an intervention effect? after controlling for the level of motivation. And that's my C prime path. And the reason that we have a prime on that C prime path is because we can compare that C prime path to, I think it's maybe my next slide here, let's see. Uh, it's not my next slide, so let me go back. We can compare that to a model, again, imagine you didn't have motivation in there. You know, you could start with a really simple model where you just say, does the intervention predict achievement, right? And so if I said, like if I, if I had X predicting Z without the mediator, that's what we call the C path. So the C path is just, 
for sure. X predicts Z, and that's C, okay? And so this is, again, just a simple linear regression. Now, in the Baron four-step procedure, and maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but this was actually like step one. Step one was like, hey, does your independent variable predict your dependent variable? If not, then there's really no point in looking for mediation. And I would argue that that is actually still true most of the time. But there is an inordinate amount of literature that's cropped up over the last 20 years that says, you know what, you can actually have something like inconsistent, what's called inconsistent mediation, where you could actually find that the bivariate effect is zero, but there still could be some sort of mediational pathways. So those are relatively rare compared to, you know, sort of normal mediation. But this, so this is one of the reasons that the four-step procedure has fallen out of favor, because people say, ah, you know what, you don't actually have to just start by estimating this C path and saying, if I don't see a relationship between X and Z, there's no mediation there. Because maybe there is still something going on, but it's just kind of wacky. And we'll, I'll show you how that could be in a minute. Um, so that's the C path. Okay, here's the C prime, and then we've got A and B. So now think about how much, you know, if we want to sort of get an estimate of how much of, you know, sort of how much does uh, the influence of X on Z, how much is that sort of mediated by Y, or how much, this will also be called an indirect effect then how can we figure that out? We want to know how much, right? Like we've got, we've got this set, set up and we want to know, like, we want to know about what's sort of the strength of this mediational pathway of, you know, how much of the effect of X on Y is mediated, or sorry, effect of X on Z is mediated through Y. Yeah, so one way, there are actually two ways you can do this, right? So way one would be, you'd be like, hey, well, you know, I could compare C and C prime, right? So I could say C minus C prime, right? That's actually going to give me some idea about how much, you know, how much of this X to Z relationship is being mediated by Y, right? So C minus C prime sort of gives me this idea of this, I'm going to call it an indirect effect. And those will still be the path coefficients, not something else tied to the path, right? Yeah, and these are just path coefficients. That's exactly right, unstandardized or standardized. And in mediation, there's some disagreement about whether you should be looking at unstandardized or standardized path coefficients. So some people will say, you should always look at unstandardized. Some people will say, ah, you know, it's a lot easier to think about it than standardized. And some people will, you know, again, be a little more nuanced than either of those extremes. So, that gives you an idea of your indirect effect. What's another way that you could get an idea about sort of the effect of X on Z that is, you know, sort of mediated by Y? Looking at um, the coefficient that we get from A uh, and times B. Yeah, exactly. Just use our tracing rule, right? And if you think about our tracing rule, we could say, okay, the effect of X on Y, like, is A, and then this independent contribution of Y on Z after controlling for X is B, right? And so, you know, if I want to get sort of this estimate of this indirect effect of X on Z through Y, then I could just take A times B, right? And so, theoretically at least, do this, A times B should actually be equal to C minus C prime. Now, you know, and that is true, actually, if you do this, like, if you, if you do sort of like OLS regression, it's not going to be necessarily, I, you know, you're going to get something that's approximately equal with maximum likelihood estimation. So there are sort of two different ways that you can estimate this indirect effect. One is C minus C prime. The other is A times B. And those are going to be up approximately equal when we use when we use maximum likelihood strategies. Okay. 
Uh, let me get back to our slides here. Okay, so why would we why would we want to use SEM for mediation rather than just doing something? Well, often often we'll have much more complicated mediational models than just this little three variable model anyway, right? But why would we want to use SEM for multi, uh, for mediation rather than just running a series of multiple regression equations? Did you do mediation and regression? I don't even know. A little bit. Okay, so, you know, it's kind of a pain to do it in regression because you got to do it in two steps, right? There's no way to run the model all in one step. So, you know, that's a huge, that's a huge advantage of the SEM approach. Um, we can certainly do better handling of missing data when we move into maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, we can compute these indirect effects, bootstrap our confidence intervals. Uh, we, can, we can fit over identified models and we can look at model fit. And then I think incredibly importantly, uh, we can handle latent variables, right? And remember, we talked about this issue of measurement error and predictors being really problematic. And I'm going to talk in a little while about the fact that measurement error in predictors and mediators is really problematic in mediation models. So, you know, being able to handle all of this in the latent variable modeling framework, if we have latent variables, is certainly probably one of the most cute, the most important advantages of SEM for mediation. Okay, so I totally got ahead of myself, but here's our beginning model, right? We've got X predicting Y. Oh, I messed up there because in my last one, it was Z. Oh, I'm sorry. But this is the independent variable. This is the ultimate dependent variable. I changed, okay, this is X and M and Z, uh, Y, sorry. So, whoops, hold on, let me go back. So we've got the same thing though that I was just talking about, A path, right? B path and our C prime path. That's our simple mediational model. So the Baron and Kenny steps are pretty simple. Again, these were all built to be able to be done sort of in a multiple regression framework. So step one is just test that C path. Step two is test the A path, which remember I said like, okay, well, if we're gonna have mediation, X has to predict M. This is just a simple bivariate, right? Sort of simple linear regression. And if X doesn't predict M, then there's no way that M can mediate the X, Y relationship. Like it's not possible. So if it turns out that this A path is zero, right? Then think about it, the A times B path will also be zero. So we don't have an indirect effect. And in turn, when you look at C minus C prime, you're not gonna get a difference. C and C prime are basically gonna be the same. So, so, so first, as I said, we test the C path, or we could test the C path, it's not actually technically necessary. Test the A path, right? Certainly, we're not gonna do it in the set of four steps, but we certainly need the A path to be non-zero. And then we look at M and X on Y, so we look at the mediator and the independent variable on Y, and really we need there to be an effect of the mediator on the outcome variable after controlling for the independent variable, right? If all of the relationship between the mediator and the outcome variable is actually explained by X, then again, we don't have any kind of indirect effect or mediational model. And then finally, you know, look at the C prime path, right? So we look at X and M on Y. So steps three and four are actually done in the same model. But you're just looking at the B path and the C prime path. And the total effect, so that's the C path here, the total effect of X on Y should actually be the sum of the direct effect of X on Y, that's C prime, right? Plus the indirect effect of X on Y through M, which is the A times B path. So if you wanna think about the total effect of X on Y, total effect would be C, right? Or it's also C prime plus A times B, right? Those should equal each other. So we can say the total effect is a function of this direct effect. Remember we talked about direct effects and indirect effects? So C prime is a direct effect and A times B is actually what we call our indirect. 
and this whole thing should equal C, and that's going to be our total effect. So yeah, we sort of talked about that back in the first and second weeks of the class. All right. Uh, so one of the things, oops, let me go back here. One of the things that people are interested in is, well, do you have complete mediation? In complete mediation, the C prime path would actually equal zero. So that means, yeah, after I control for Y or M, whatever, after I control for the mediator, this direct effect is equal to zero. So that would mean that any effect of the, let's go back to our example, any effect of my intervention on achievement is, a, is actually sort of can be it's sort of via motivation. So there's no effect of the intervention on achievement that isn't explained by these two variables joint, you know, sort of co-variation with motivation. And that's what's called a that's what's called total mediation. So in total mediation, the C prime path is zero. And that's kind of a nice thing because it sort of means you're okay, I'm explaining, right? I'm explaining sort of I'm explaining this relationship is sort of completely explained by my mediator. That doesn't have to be the case, right? We, but it's kind of nice when that happens. We can also have what's called partial mediation. And in partial mediation, the C prime path is smaller than the C path, right? So there is some statistically significant A times B product, right? So there is, there is mediation but it doesn't completely explain the relationship between X and Z or, you know, independent and dependent variables. So going back to our example, if the C prime path shrinks, but it's not zero and, and this A times B is statistically significant, that says, yeah, okay. So, you know, some of how the intervention seems to be affecting people's achievement is through increased motivation, but there are other reasons too, right? The intervention is having other effects other than just on motivation, which could be, I don't know, what could be some other effects that the intervention might have other than on motivation? I you don't even know what the intervention is, but I mean, we can think of other things, right? Like, peer. yeah, peer relationships or, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. So, okay. Um, so again, complete mediation is nice, but it's not, it's not necessary to have complete mediation. But if we want to talk about having mediation, we at least need to know that there, that this A times B compound path is actually statistically significant, right? That, or, I mean, conversely, I mean, another way of thinking about that would be that this C minus C prime is actually not zero. So we need either for C minus C prime, or A times B, those are, again, conceptually equivalent, but whichever way you want to think about it, we need that indirect effect to not be zero. If the indirect effect is zero, then that says, okay, well, this relationship between my independent and dependent variable is not explained by this third mediating variable. Okay, so that is really kind of like, uh, again, there are these four steps, but really the most important thing is really evaluating that indirect effect. Is that indirect effect, you know, statistically significant? Is it, you know, sort of meaningful? Um, so I've already said actually everything that's on this slide. We already talked about that. So the difference in coefficients between C and C prime is approximately equal to A times B, which is the product of those two paths. They'll be exactly equal in OLS. They're not going to be exactly equal in maximum likelihood, but they should be close. So we're not going to lose sleep over that. And we lose maximum likelihood in SDM. Yeah, we're, use, we're never going to use OLS in, in SDM, right? So we're using maximum likelihood in SDM. Um, so again, I've said this already, but the total effect then is just the indirect effect plus the direct effect, right? The direct effect is C prime, the indirect effect is A times B, 
and the total effect is a times b plus c prime. And this all actually falls right out of our tracing rules, if you think about it. There's nothing actually new here. We've talked about direct, indirect, and total effects. We're just sort of putting them in the framework of mediation. Okay. So I, I mentioned that you know it could be possible for the C path to be zero and still have mediation. And so inconsistent mediation is a situation where the A times B path, so this indirect effect, and the C prime path, the direct effect, they have different signs. And so you could imagine, right, if let's just say the A times B path is positive and the C prime path is negative, and if they're about of equal, you know, sort of equal magnitude, then you could actually get a situation where the C path is essentially zero, and yet there is, you know, so there is sort of, there is shared variance between X and Y through the mediator, right? But it's just that the direct effect actually functions in the opposite direction. And so if you look at the total effect, you get something that basically washes out the direct effect and the indirect effect. So that's called inconsistent mediation. And again, you know, luckily it's, it's not something we see all the time, but it certainly, it certainly can happen. And what are some, you know, issues here? Well, that obviously if you were using the four step procedure, you know, you would stop at step one and be like, oh, no sense in looking at mediation. And you would not recognize that you have inconsistent mediation. And then you can also get weird things like the percent mediated could actually end up being greater than 100%. We're not going to worry about that too much. Um, so, so for these reasons, we're really going to want to focus more on the A times B product rather than, you know, sort of doing the four steps. Um, so, you know, ideally we'd like to see, we'd like to see a decent sized product of A times B, which would then lead to the difference between the direct effect and the total effect, right? The C and the C prime path, we should get a, you know, a decent sized difference there. So again, we could theoretically test the statistical significance between the C and the C prime path. That would be one way of approaching this problem. Or we could just test the product of A times B, which should give us the same thing as that difference. Um, and that's what we're going to do, because we're going to do all, like we're going to do this in a simultaneous structural equation model. Here's the like little wrinkle. We need right, so so far everything is good, no problem. Like really, we haven't done anything new. The problem is we need a standard error. We need some sort of a standard error for either this difference or for this for this indirect effect. So we need a standard error for the indirect effect. And that's not necessarily so easy, right? We have a standard error for the A path, and we have a standard error for the B path, and actually we have standard errors for the C and the C prime paths, but what we need is a standard error for the product of A times B. So how are we gonna do that? Well, it turns out that it's a little bit more complicated than it might seem because, you know, it's a product term. So the distribution of that product of A times B is likely to be skewed, which if you stop and think about it, it makes sense, right? Imagine you have sort of two, two normally distributed, you know, two normal distributions, right? You take the product of those two normal distributions you are not going to get a normal distribution. In fact, again, if you sort of if you think about it, you're likely to get a, a highly uh, positively skewed distribution. So the distribution of that indirect effect is, is likely to be highly skewed, which is going to lower A, lower the power of the test, and B, uh, make it difficult to use normal theory to derive the standard error, or make it difficult, make it wrong to use normal theory to derive the standard error, right? So like all, most of our analytic solutions for standard errors, they assume that we have that, you know, they assume a normal distribution. But I'm telling you, we don't expect a normal distribution, so we can't really rely on, you know, normal sort of 
can't rely on sort of normal normal theory that we sort of relied on normally to just sort of analytically derive standard errors. And even if, again, I'm not saying A and B aren't going to be normally distributed. It's just that, you know, even if A and B are perfectly normally distributed, that the product of A times B is not necessarily going to be normally distributed. It's highly, you know, it's not going to be normally distributed. And what, the, you know, again, whoops, hold on. Let's go back. So, um, all right. So what are we going to do? How, how can we like deal with this problem? So, you know, again, there have been a lot of different ways that people have dealt with this. Um, one is, you know, well, like maybe we can just test A and B separately, right? Like if A is statistically significant and B is statistically significant, then I'll just say like, okay, well, then and A times B should also be statistically significant. You can see what the problem that logic are, right? So, you know, you can do some sort of a joint test of A and B separately. I mean, um, and which would actually be a little bit, a little bit more involved than what I just said, but still, still problematic. Um, the other solution actually was to kind of come up with a, like a, an approximation for a standard error. That sort of takes into account the, the fact that we're actually we've got this product term. And so that's what's called um, the Sobel test. And you'll still see reference to the Sobel test in lots of uh, lots of work on mediation. And so the Sobel test says, okay, you know, if we're trying to get the, the, the a standard error for the indirect effect, what I can do is I can actually, you know, I can sort of derive that as this is going to be like. The, so B is now my B path, right? So it's like my regression coefficient for B squared times the standard error of the regression weight for A squared plus the regression coefficient for A squared times the standard error for the B path or the B regression coefficient squared. It turns out that that's really not technically right and there should also be a, a correction in there. So the Aroian test equation actually is the same thing, but you can see that there's actually now the, the standard error for the A path squared times the standard error for the B path squared becomes another term in the denominator for the standard error. And luckily, this usually is pretty small because, you know, the two standard errors are pretty small. So it can get to the point where this is sort of a negligible correction, but technically, actually, this is the, this is the more correct standard error. Um, but, you know, this test isn't great. It, it still makes a lot of assumptions. Uh, the confidence, you know, the confidence interval that you're going to get if you use this um, is not going to be the correct confidence interval because, again, like, if we use this to derive a standard error, then if we create, you know, we would assume I've got the standard error, I would create a confidence interval using the standard error but that would assume that I have a symmetric distribution. So even if this standard error idea is certainly better than, better than the alternative, I still haven't totally solved this problem of the asymmetry in my distribution of the A times B, right? Because think about what you would do. You would take the standard error and you would use that to come up with a test of statistical significance. You would use that to come up with confidence intervals. But anytime you use it for a test of statistical significance or for confidence intervals, you're making the assumption that you have a symmetric distribution, which is not true. All right. So we're not going to do that either. Oops. Let me make sure. Okay. Yeah. Next. Um, just to kind of mention as an aside, too, that, you know, in terms of power for mediational models, the larger the correlation between the predictor and the mediator, that's kind of interesting, and you know, I'll let you think about it a little bit on your own, but the larger the correlation between the predictor and the mediator, the larger the sample size that you need to test the effects of the B path and the C prime path. So like, as A gets bigger, it kind of, uh, it kind of, uh, well, I mean, if you think about it, if the A path is really, really, really big, it's explaining most of the variance in the B path, right? 
So that can actually become, you know, problematic. So the effective sample size for these kinds of models is actually your total sample size times one minus the R squared between the independent variable and the mediator. So for example, if you have 400 people, but the correlation between the predictor and the mediator is 0.7, then your effective sample size is actually like 400 times 1 minus 0.49, which is like 204. So this is kind of like, a, you know, sort of a, an interesting thing about mediation models. You know, you actually would like the A paths and B paths to be kind of close to the same size, but you'd actually like the B path to be a little bit bigger. So if the A path is, as the A path gets really, really big, that actually becomes problematic. So like the ideal, the ideal situation for a mediation model is when the A and B paths are sort of, you know, not hugely different from each other, but the B path is actually a little bit bigger than the A path. Just kind of, again, kind of interesting. All right. So, you know, when we think about mediators, we can think about them as being like either proximal or distal mediators, right? So I've got, again, for any mediation model, really we should be collecting over time data. A lot of times people use mediation models with cross-sectional data, but there are obviously problems with that from a sort of a causal perspective, um, among other things. But so if you think about this as like, okay, I've got, you know, I've got my intervention, I've got this mediator like motivation, and I've got my outcome like achievement. I mean, if I'm measuring the mediator too close in time, to let's say the start of the intervention, right? Or, or well, maybe that's a bad example. But let's say it's let's say it's motivation, self-regulation, and I'll make it non-experimental because motivation, self-regulation, and achievement, right? And so if I measure motivation and self-regulation really close in time to each other, then I might get a higher correlation between the two. I'm going to get a higher correlation between the two of them because I've measured them close together, right? I mean, there's going to be a correlation, but if I measure them further away in time, I'm going to get a lower correlation between them. So the correlation that I see is going to be a function of sort of two things, right? It, it, it's, it's a function not just of how correlated these variables are, but it's also a function of how much time has elapsed, right? So if you think about it, the two variables should be most correlated if you measure them at the same point in time, right? And as you measure them at different points in time, you sort of expect the correlation to go down. So, you know, if you're measuring the mediator too close to the X variable, then what can happen is, you know, that A path can actually, you know, that A path could actually be relatively large. And as I just said, from a design perspective, that's not ideal, right? Um, so, you know, with a proximal mediator, you might get an A path that's larger and a B path. I mean, it may just turn out that way anyway, but I'm just saying sort of in the scheme of things, you get like an A, a big A path and a relatively small B path. With a distal mediator, maybe you're measuring the mediator too close to the outcome variable. And so, okay, so then there the B path should be large and the A path should be small. Given what I just said about power, that's actually probably a better situation than the, the, the proximal situation. But from a design perspective, you really want to be thinking about, right, when, when you should be, you know, you would like the mediator to have a chance to be affected by the independent variable, to affect the dependent variable, and to ideally not be too, too close in time to either one of them. All right. Uh, so I already said all the rest of this. So, you know, these are things to think about when you're designing your study. Um, so, you know, Klein in his book talks about this idea of the mediation myth and says, you know, this is kind of like a naming fallacy. So mediation, and, and this is, I, I think, like, over the last 10 to 20 years, where a lot of the focus, you really sort of get into the mediational literature, there's, or, or the literature in this, there, there's, there really are, there's a sort of a whole camp of people who would say, you shouldn't use the word mediation, because mediation really sort of implies, it sounds like it implies causation. And, you know, if you really want to make a causal inference, then, you know, again, that's a property of your design. And um, just because you've got three variables and you sort of set up a set of equations with three variables doesn't mean that you can infer causality, which, by the way, that is totally true. I am on board with that. Um, but 
Uh, and so for that reason, we shouldn't use the term mediation because when we say mediation, people, are, you know, they assume that there's, that what we're really talking about is some sort of a, a causal pathway rather than just shared variance, right? And so instead, we should talk about direct, indirect, and total effects. Because direct, indirect, and total effects don't have that same sort of, you know, causal flavor to them. Yeah, well, yeah, and then you always have to hedge and say, like, I said effect, but I don't mean effect in, like, a causal way. I just mean effect in, like, a statistical way. It gets really tricky, right? Um, yeah, I mean, that's true. That's true. But uh, so, so the idea though is, you know, so there's been this backlash against even talking about mediation. And, and it, it has happened more in some fields than others. So I feel like in psychology, you'll still see quite a bit of discussion of mediation. But if you go over like into public health and medicine, I mean, they don't use the word mediation. Generally, my experience is that they don't use the word mediation at all. They talk about direct and indirect and total. Unless, Unless they're talking about causal mediation, which we are not going to talk about in this class, but you can talk about that in advanced causal, and it's super cool. Um, but you know, in the health sciences and in uh, public health and medicine, they won't say the word mediation unless they're talking about causal mediation. So, um, I think, um, yeah, the diagram that you draw for mediation is also uh, also helps to resonate because we have directed path instead of like having two-headed arrows between X and Y and Y and Z. Like, yes, that's true. And, and that's one of the things that we'll talk about. I mean, well, one of the real problems, and this is what makes cross-sectional data especially problematic. This is a just identified model, right? So my fit's going to be perfect, right? So my chi-square is zero, my degrees of freedom are zero. Well, what's an equivalent model to this one? Okay. This model is absolutely mathematically, statistically equivalent. But that says something really different, right? But it's an equivalent model. It's also equivalent to just saying there are correlations among these variables. It's also equivalent to saying that the mediator actually, right, causes, you know, X and Y, and maybe there's a correlation among their disturbances, right? So the problem, the problem, one of the problems, there are many problems, one of the problems especially even just thinking about it with this simple three variable example is that just because I, and this is true in SEM in general. So just because I draw a pathway with a particular direction doesn't make it so, right? My theory about which direction the path should go, but you know, I could be wrong, right? And the really tricky thing is that, you know, we've talked about testing competing models, um, but Again, if you have a model like this, this little just identified three variable model, all of these other models are equivalent. So they're all gonna fit exactly the same. So there's no way to test whether, you know, whether this one fits better than that one fits better than this one, because they're all just identified. They're all equivalent models. Yeah. But so you in longitudinal data would kind of negate this issue if X is measured at time one and is measured at time two, Y is measured Yeah, so again, it doesn't completely solve the causal issue because again, we, we, you know, there are some, but it certainly helps a whole, whole bunch in terms of thinking about the direction of the arrows, right? It doesn't make any sense to predict something that happens at a prior time point. Having said that, there could be some unmeasured, you know, confound, I mean, that's the thing, like, that's true, but then there could be some other, other unmeasured confounder, or maybe just because I measured motivation at the prior time point and I measured achievement at the later time point, maybe it's really that achievement predicts motivation. But I just I just have this only at the prior time point. I have a couple of slides here where I'll show you some 
designs that kind of um, some a little bit more complicated designs that you get help to sort of don't, don't completely solve the problem, but but sort of help in that way. But yeah, so this is one reason though that running a cross-sectional model is especially problematic. So having a longitudinal model doesn't necessarily solve all the problems, but it's certainly way better than having a cross-sectional model, right? Um, all right. Uh, so what are some of the assumptions that we make when we, so we'll talk, I want to talk about like statistical assumptions and causal assumptions, okay? So our statistical assumptions are, you know, our basic same old statistical assumptions we made throughout this class. Linearity, normality, and homogeneity, and independence of errors, you know, your basic sort of general linear modeling types of assumptions. Okay, so no problem there. I mean, there may be problems, but there are same old problems. So now let's talk about the causal assumptions that are sort of baked into these mediation models, okay? So again, our causal assumptions here are not necessarily solved statistically. You know, our, we need to really think about these, we need to think about causality in terms of the, well, and causal assumptions in terms of the design and the measurement and the theory, not necessarily just sort of the analysis or the stats. So again, you know, I, I just talked about this idea that mediation sort of implies causality in, in some way. If you can't establish that the model is causal, you know, you're probably better off trying to use correlational, you are better off trying to use correlational language. Okay. So what are these causal, in order to sort of say it's causal, here are some of the assumptions that we need to make. First, you need to make the assumption that the mediator and the independent variable don't interact to cause y. So there's no moderation. Um, and we'll talk about moderation later in the semester, so we can kind of come back to moderated mediation. We're not going to do moderated mediation today. But, I mean, this is actually easily, easily tested. So, you know, you can check. Um, and if you have an interaction, that sort of suggests that you have some sort of effect heterogeneity, right? That the... Um, that this, this relationship is not, you know, is a function, right, of some sort of moderator. Um, so what is a, you know, what does that moderation of a mediational pathway really mean? It means that the mediational pathway differs across people or sites or, or whatever. So that's sort of our first assumption. Second assumption, this is the big, I mean, there are lots of big, but this is a huge one. Uh, that there are no reverse causal effects. So in order to talk about a mediation model as a sort of a causal model, then we have to assume that there are, that the outcome can't be, right, the cause of the mediator. The mediator can't be the cause of the independent variable, right? Um, and so that's, that's, a real, that's a really big assumption and not something that we can solve just with our models, with our sort of SEM models. So what can we do to sort of help ourselves in terms of this causal assumption? Well, the first is, you know, randomization is best, right? So like, obviously, you know, in my example where I was saying that X is, you know, an intervention, if people are randomly assigned to treatment or control, right, then I, then I know there's no way that the mediator is causing who's assigned to treatment or control or the outcome variable is causing who's assigned to treatment or control. So, you know, to the degree to which we can use randomization, that's going to help us here, right? Theory, obviously, you know, doesn't prove anything, but theory sort of is helpful. And then timing a measurement we already talked about, cross-sectional designs are especially problematic just because it's longitudinal doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have reverse causal effects, but it is certainly, certainly more problematic if everything's measured at the same time. So, you know, here, actually, from the Klein book, these are all equivalent models with three variables. I mean, that's crazy, right? Look at all those different, so there's no way just based on, you know, like we can run, there's no way based on anything we're talking about in this class that we could distinguish among any of these models, which is bad news, right? Which is why, again, we really, you know, we really need to sort of lean on design to help us sort of make sense of this. So this is the design I was going to say. So I said, you know, just because you measure uh, the mediator after the independent variable, 
doesn't necessarily mean that you know that, that your arrows are sort of going in the right way. So there's this model, again, this doesn't completely solve the problem, but there's this model called a half longitudinal design, which is kind of cool, where instead of just measuring the, you know, the independent variable, the mediator, and the outcome variable, you know, sort of once, what you'll see here is that, you know, we've got the, you know, mediator and the outcome variable are actually measured across time. And all three of the variables are sort of measured at time one, and then the mediator and the outcome variable are measured at time two. And so this is kind of cool, right? Because you can, you know, if you think about it, you get, you, you can sort of get a sense of, you know, okay, here's my like, here's my A path from X1 to M2, right? Here's my B path from M1 to Y2, right? Here's my C prime path from Y1 to Y2. But I also, you know, I can also see you know, how these variables are related and how, you know, how well they predict each other across time. So again, doesn't, doesn't totally solve the problem, but sort of a better, better design. Um, okay, I don't really want to say anything about this. This is just an example of it. Here's an even cooler design. So here's a full longitudinal design where, again, I mean, very cheap here too, but, um, which we'll talk about next week. But here's a full longitudinal design. So again, you know, we've got, you can sort of imagine we've got this X variable, let's say. We've got this mediator, right? And then we've got this Y variable. And what's kind of cool here is, you know, here we've got multiple overtime measures. And so, you know, you can sort of think about, you're getting, you're actually sort of getting within the, within the study, you're getting replications of the A path and replications of, the B path, right? So that's, that's, and replications of the C prime path. So that's kind of cool too. So you get actually multiple, shouldn't say estimators, sorry, that's a typo. Just say yields most multiple estimates of the indirect effect. So that, I mean, that, that's kind of, it's like two replications of a half longitudinal design all combined into one design. Again, does this completely solve the causal effect, the causal problem? No does not completely solve the problem, but is better than just a simple cross-sectional design with new variables, right? All right, another big causal assumption. This is, this is I don't know which one was bigger. This is huge. No omitted variables. So we have all the variables that we need in our model. This is like never true, right? <laughs> um, so, it's kind of depressing, but it's true. It's like that, you know. So the variance that the mediator shares with the outcome, it could be due to some other variable that isn't in my model, right? So imagine this. And this happens all the time, sadly. Right? So this is like, I'm going to call this O for my omitted variable. So there's some variable out there, and it predicts, you know, it predicts the mediator, and it predicts the outcome, for example. I mean, we could, you know. I could, have multiple. I, could have an, I could have an O2 here. You know, I could have an omitted variable that predicts, right, the X variable and the mediator. I mean, I think these are the important variables, but I didn't measure all the variables, and there are variables out there that are actually really important that I didn't measure, and they actually explain the pattern of covariances that I'm seeing. And I have no way of knowing that because I didn't measure those variables. So I, like, go along my merry way and I talk about how important these variables are, not realizing that sort of lurking somewhere in the water are these omitted variables that I haven't measured, right? Um, so what's the solution here? I mean, again, randomization is good for lots of things. So randomize, randomize, randomize when you can. Uh, another thing is, and this is more easily said than done, right? I can be flippant here. Measure them. If you have omitted variables, you should not omit them. You should measure them. I mean, that, like I say, I'm being flippant here because that's easy to say and it's hard to do. Maybe you don't know there's an omitted gene. You know that was an important variable. So, of course, you can't necessarily be responsible for measuring every potential important variable, but you certainly do want to think through and, you know, you know there are potential omitted variables, you're best off measuring them. And again, you know, having baseline measures if you're really looking for this kind of process, can be helpful. I mean, so 
Again, huge causal assumption, not solved by SEM. But the nice thing about SEM is that we can have these much more complicated models where we can include you know, confounders more easily and then sort of, right, we can build, we can build more realistic models than we maybe can in some other techniques, but, you know, again, not solving that problem. Uh, you know, there are a few, there are other, other additional causal assumptions. I would say the no omitted variables and the no reverse causation are the two biggest problems. Uh, but, you know, there are, there are other problems as well, like, you know, we're sort of assuming that we have a stable sort of, we can equilibrium, we have a sort of a stable system. There aren't other obvious threats to the internal validity of our study. Uh, measurement, which I'm going to talk more about in a little while. So, of course, uh, I'm assuming that I'm measuring all of my variables without error. And the degree to which I have measurement error is going to bias my coefficients, even if I were meeting all of the other causal assumptions. Um, so, so those are, you know, again, I'll, I'm going to talk more about measurement in a minute, but those are some additional causal assumptions. So measurement error in the mediator. We've already talked about the fact that if we have measurement error in a predictor variable, that we get a biased effect estimate, right? We did talk about that, didn't we, at some point? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's true. So just remember that. And if we have measurement error in the mediator, that also is going to give us biased estimates of the effects. And um, you know, generally the effect of and again, it's really easy to kind of map this out for a three variable scenario. It's as I'll show in a minute. It's much harder to map out what the what the pattern of bias would be if you have a whole slew of variables in a more complicated mediational model. Um, but, you know, sort of in simpler mediation models, the effect of the mediator, that B path, is likely to be underestimated, and the effect of the initial variable on the outcome, that C prime path, is actually likely to be overestimated if the A times B path is positive which would be when either the A and B paths are both negative or the A and B paths are both positive. So if the A times B product is positive and you have measurement error in the mediator, then you're going to tend to underestimate the B path, which remember I said is a really important path earlier, and you're going to tend to overestimate the direct effect, that C prime path. Okay? Um, and the A path is also likely to be underestimated. So that's really bad news. There's a great paper. I will, I want to, I'll hit a few highlights from it right now. I would encourage all of you to read it, um, especially, especially if this is your area. Um, it's called Manifest Variable Path Analysis, Serious and Misleading Consequences Due to Uncorrected Measurement Error. Ooh which is a really scary title, isn't it? Uh, by Colin Preacher, it's in Psych Methods from 2013. And they actually go through and they show in great detail why and how measurement error can be a problem. They sort of start with some simple models and then they kind of build up some, to some more complicated models. I'm not gonna talk much about their, the conversations that they have in the paper about more complicated models because the bottom line, once you sort of slug through those few pages is with more complicated models, the bias could be, like you can't really predict the direction of the bias very well. Like there's gonna be bias, it's really hard to predict in what direction. So that, that's, kinda, that's kinda hard. But I'm gonna show you just for a simple three variable case so you can kinda see what happens. Um, you know, again, big problems with measurement error and the problems become less predictable and sort of in some sense more serious as you get more, model, uh, as you get more variables. So let's just stay with a simple three variable case, okay? And say, let's say you have three latent variables, they're measured without error, okay? So here we go. We've got, right, sort of D predicting E, and that path is 0.4, E predicting F, that path is 0.5, and D predicting F, and that direct effect is 0.2. So these are latent variables, 
They're measured without error. So this is, again, this is, this is, this is like reality. Okay. So remember, if we use the tracing rule, we should be able to go from paths and correlations and back again, right? So I can easily figure out, given this, given this sort of triangle, right, of, of variables, I can easily figure out what the, well, and they're not even model applied correlations here because they only have three variables. So this is just identified, right? There is no model this fit. I can actually exactly reproduce the correlations here using the paths, and I can get from the correlations to the paths. So what I see here is that, you know, the correlations between D and E and D and F are actually 0.4, and the correlation between E and F is 0.58. Okay? All right. So remember, a standardized partial regression coefficient this is, again, just from multiple regression, is the effect of x1 on y with x2 held constant, right? So how do we compute that? Well, we can look at the correlation between y and 1, right? Minus the correlation between y and 2 and the correlation between 1 and 2 divided by 1 minus the correlation between 1 and 2 squared, right? So that's going to give us the regression coefficient for the effect of one variable one on y. And then we can do the same thing here for the regression coefficient for the effect of variable two on y. It's just going to be the correlation between y and two minus the correlation between y and one times the correlation between one and two divided by, again, it's the same denominator, one minus the correlation between the two variables. Okay? And remember that this beta is just giving us the, like, the amount of change in Y standard deviation units that's expected per standard deviation unit change in X. Okay. So here I go. So I could actually use these formulas, right? And all I've done is I've said, okay, well, D, E, and F now become my variables 1, 2, and Y, right? And I can figure out what is the regression coefficient, right, here? So, you know, I can actually get the regression coefficient for the effect of D on F by just plugging in these correlations, right? The correlation between D and F, which is 0.4, times the correlation between E and F, which is 0.58, times the correlation between uh, D and I said D and E, which is also 0.4, right? So I get 0.168 divided by 1 minus 0.4 squared, which is 0.84. And if I do all that out, I'm actually going to get this regression coefficient of 0.2, which is good, as it should be. Is everybody with me? And so, this, so far, this is just a review of multiple regression. Okay, I can do the same thing here. I can get the, I can, I can get the beta. For, for this, for the 0.5, right? For the effect of E on F. So now it's going to be the correlation between E and F minus the correlation between D and E and the times the correlation between uh, whatever what one is left over. I'm forgetting my letters right now. Uh, divided by the one minus the correlation between those two independent variables. And again, I can do this. And if you do out the math, you'll get 0.5. So far, so good. Okay, so what happens though if the mediator is measured with error? So now notice that instead of having a latent variable here for E, I'm, I'm saying this is E prime, okay? And I'm going to say that the path, now this is a very, this is like a highly unreliable variable here. Let's say the path from the latent variable E to E prime is actually 0.7, okay? So the correlation between latent E and observed E is 0.7. So what's going to happen? All right. Well, what's going to happen is that we're actually going to have to attenuate the correlations for measurement error, right? We're not going to get the same pattern of correlations anymore. And so 
I can figure out, again, I can use the formula, the correction for attenuation formula, to figure out what the attenuated correlations would be. And just to kind of remind yourself how that works, the correlation between two variables when we correct it for attenuation is, it's like the correlation, is this observed correlation divided by the, basically, the reliability of each of the variables, you know, the product of those reliabilities, and then we take the square root. So the reliability is the squared pattern coefficient between the factor and the observed variable. So in our case, the reliability, even though the, the correlation between the factor and the observed variable is 0.7, the reliability is actually 0.7 squared, which is 0.49. So that's why I said it's actually low reliability, right? So it's not a very reliable measure. But okay, fine. So I do that, I can think, but once I do that, I can figure out what is the correlation now corrected for attenuation. And it turns out that the correlation between D and E, and like my fallible E, my unreliably measured E, is now 0.28, which is actually not at all what it was like before, right? It was, uh, it was 0.4. Okay, well, that's kind of problematic, right? So now I've got 0.28, and now I can actually, I can figure out now what are these other correlations going to be? And, and when I do this, what I find is that, so my correlation between D and F is unchanged here, because we're really looking at the measurement error in the mediator. Um, but the, right, so D and F are both still latent variables. So that's why the correlation is unchanged, yeah? Oh, no, 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 this is a thought experiment. You wouldn't. Okay, cool. I was just yeah, 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 yeah. You would use the latent variable. But my point is like, you don't, like, conceptually, these are the latent correlations. Like, this is perfect world, but I don't know that. I just have this crappy measure. That's my mediator, right? So in a perfect world, these are what the correlations would be. But once I add in my crappy mediator, what are my observed correlations going to be? They're going to be radically different, right? Like, again, these two are both latent variables still, so it doesn't, doesn't affect this correlation because D and F are still perfectly measured. I've only messed with E. But messing with E, you can see that the correlation between D and, and, and bad E, right, like my, my observed E is 0.28, so it's smaller. And you can see the correlation between E and F, which was 0.58, is now 0.406. So I don't have the same correlations anymore. Well, what does that mean when I go to get my regression coefficients? If I don't have the same correlations, I'm not going to get the same regression coefficients, right? So when I go through and I work this out using those, and again, I'm going to not go through all the math. You can go, you know, you can go through it on your own. But when I use these correlations now and plug them into that formula that I showed you before, now I get a regression coefficient that's 0.31 instead of before I had, a core, I, had, I had a regression coefficient from D to F, right, that was 0.2. And notice, that's the regression coefficient from D to F, and those are both actually still latent variables, perfectly measured. I only messed with E, my mediator, and even just messing with E, the latent variable path was 0.2, and now that path is 0.31. So I'm overestimating the C prime path and by quite a bit. What happens to my other paths? Well, you can imagine. Remember the path from E to F was 0.5. If I plug everything in here, what I find is that now my path from the mediator to the outcome variable is 0.32. So it dropped from 0.5 to 0.32. And then finally, the D to E path, so that's the path from the independent variable to the mediator, it was 0.4, and now it drops to 0.28. So basically, I'm underestimating the A path by a lot, like 0.4 to 0.28, that's a big drop, right? I'm underestimating the, um, the E to F path, so from mediator to outcome variable from 0.5 to 0.32, that's a 0.18. 
That's a huge underestimation. Of course, again, remember, it's very unreliable, very for pedagogical reasons. That makes it much more exciting when things look really bad, right? Are you excited by how bad these paths look, or is it just me? I don't know. Anyway, um, but and I'm overestimating that C prime path. So basically, my I'm wrong. I'm just wrong, right? It's in that that's bad. Okay. So um, so the measurement error, so again, here, whoops, hold on, let me go back. So, you know, again, you can slog through the computations yourself later, but the important point is right here. Trust that I did the computations right, which I did. Um, here's my here's my original with all latent variables, and here's what I get if I have a really crappy mediator and I fit this model with just that one really crappy mediator, right? So I underestimate my A and B paths and I overestimate my C prime path. And again, I mean, like, this isn't just like, oh, it's a little bit biased. You would probably, if you were gonna write a story, if these were your variables, you would probably say really different things looking at this, this set of path coefficients versus this set of path coefficients, right? You know, they're really, I mean, they're really, they're really different. Like here, the 0 0.31 and the 0 0.32 are about the same size. And like the C prime path is, you know, just about as big as this B path, right? And then like here, you can see this really looks like there's more evidence in some sense of mediate, you know, right? We've got sort of more of a mediational thing going on here. We've got bigger paths from A to B and B to C, or D to E and E to F, right? So our A and B paths are bigger and our C prime path is smaller. So uh, you know, it's not a subtle thing. Again, it's a very a lot of unreliability here, but it's not a subtle thing, and it would like, conceptually change probably what you would say about your model. Um, so, you know, this is bad. All right. Then the other thing is, you know, if the correlation between, let's say, the late, a latent factor in the observed mediator is 0.7, the A and B paths are underestimated, right? And the actual correlation between D and F is 0.3, but the model implied correlation, if you kind of go through and look at this, um, you know, if you were to, you know, the model implied correlation is like, you know, 0.126. So, you know, you, again, this is potentially also going to affect the fit of your models, not just the parameter estimates, but also the fit of your models. So, so basically, you know, what they're saying is, you know, when you only have like a, a fallible triangle like this, like three variables, you can kind of predict based on the based on the signs of the variables, right? And the amount of unreliability, you can kind of you can kind of predict which paths are going to be over and underestimated. So at least you can kind of have a sense of that with like a simple three variable model. Um, but it gets a lot more complicated when you have a lot more variables in your model. So, you know, with exogenous variables, if you have two exogenous variables that are just simply correlated with each other, no other variable is going to actually predict either of them. So that correlation isn't necessarily, um, you know, that, that's not necessarily going to be affected by measurement error in any other variables. But the actual correlation between the variables is underestimated because they're measured with error, right? And so, you know, again, if you have a large number of purely exogenous variables, that can actually exacerbate the problem because it increases the number of correlational paths that are subject to underestimation. And, uh, okay, I think I've kind of said all of this. Um, so basically, it's really bad news. That's the bottom line. Really, really, really bad news. So, and the more complex the model is, the worse things become. So as models become more complex, the number of affected paths increases, the magnitude of the bias grows, and the effect of the results becomes harder to predict. So if you have lots of different variables, and some of them are measured unreliably, or even if only one or two in a large model are measured unreliably, it can bias it can create bias that kind of spreads all over your model in ways that can be really, really difficult to predict. It might overestimate some paths. It might underestimate other paths. Um, so that's, 
So that's the really, really bad news. So what do we do about this? Oh yeah, and this is actually, so this is just a, this is them showing like, oh, here are some of the ways that things can be affected. So what do we do to solve this problem? Well, luckily, this is one thing where we do have some control. This is again, like why we wanna use a latent variable model. Because if instead of using this crappy observed variable, if we have a few observed variables and we create a latent variable, Right? Then we're dealing with, then we can sort of deal with this problem. So obviously, the first thing is use more, you know, if you can't do a latent variable model, use more reliable predictors. So like using observed variables as predictors is more of a problem the less reliable those predictors or, or mediators, right? Using observed variables instead of latent variables is more problematic the less reliable those variables are. So, you know, there are certain variables that we measure that are observed variables that are highly reliable. Like, let's say you've got, I don't know, somebody's height or something, right? We can measure height and weight and, you know, pretty, pretty reliably, maybe not as a self-report, I don't know. But, uh, you know, there are certain measures that, that, or like, we often use achievement tests in education and we might not actually have the items for the achievement test, so we can't use, we can't build a latent variable model. But, you know, it's like a two hour achievement test and the reliabilities are super, super high. So, okay, it's gonna be less problematic in that case to use an observed variable. Whereas when we have researcher developed measures, you know, like they're notoriously unreliable, right? So if you've got, you know, a few, you know, right, you've got a short researcher developed measure um, and somebody's told you like the Chrome box alpha is 0. 0.7 or something, right? Instead of using a scale score, you're going to be much better off either using the items or using item parcels and creating a latent variable so that you can deal with this measurement error problem head on. So like unlike the design issues that we talked, like the omitted variable problem and the sort of timing problem for which there weren't any super easy solutions, here I actually have a really, really good solution for you, which is, you know, use latent variables. Plan to use latent variables and that can really help you. Or if you can't get a latent variable, make sure whatever variable you're using is very reliable. Right? There's, um, and then, you know, in some sense, like, as I said, the more complex the model, the harder it is to predict how things might go wrong. So if you've got a lot of really highly unreliable variables, that's a horrible idea to put them all in a model together and run a big model using lots of, other, lots of variables with low reliability. Because you're going to get something. But like, are you going to get something that's going to be replicable? Uh, not necessarily, right? All right, and then, oh, I'll, uh, I will stop after these slides. Uh, so this is kind of cool. So here's the type one error rate for the chi-square test. Um, and, and this might seem really weird if you like, okay. So the type, this is uh, the reliability on the x-axis. And this is the probability of a statistically significant chi-square when you shouldn't have a statistically significant chi-square because that's what type one error rate is, right? So as you can see, if we've got highly reliable measures, then our type one error rate is about you know, 0 0.05, which is what it should be, assuming we set the type one error rate at 0.05. Now, it might seem really weird though. So okay, like as the reliability goes down, the type one error rate goes up, to a certain point, but then it actually falls back down again. Why? Well, it just is so bad now, right? So bad, like that, that isn't a good sign. Yes, it's true. My type one error rate is really low, but what about my power? Well, here's my power for the chi-square test. And you can see that like the power is actually, you know, really quite good even when reliability is it's not even that great, right? Once I get to a reliability of like 0 0.4 or 0 0.5, my, my power is actually pretty good. But my power, which again, remember, this is the ability to detect an effect that is there, right? So, you know, I, I should be rejecting, right? Um, and I do. You can see that as the reliability dips, the power just falls off the map. So what that's saying is, yeah, okay, like, yeah, it's true. My type one error rate here is 0.05, but that's also because like I have no power, right? So I've got like nothing. So this is not actually good. What you can see is like, this is, this is looking better because 
This is so much worse. So taking these two things together, you can see that you know type one error control is low, is good when reliability is low because power is so low. So that's not a good thing. So you really need to be, if you want to if you want to control type one error rate and have good power, you really need to be up here, right? Close to one, a reliability of close to one. All right, I'm going to stop there. What time is it? I feel like it's time for. Really? Yeah, we'll take a break. Let's take a break till 11.15, and then we're going to talk about bootstrapping, and then we're going to run a model in M+. Oh, and I should stop recording. Let's resume. Uh, ooh, ooh. Bootstrapping. Okay, the good news is there isn't that much to say about bootstrapping. I mean... You know, okay, who knows what bootstrapping is? Okay, well maybe, okay, so bootstrapping is kind of cool. So the idea here is, and you know, where we get the term bootstrapping is this idea of, you know how people say, well, if you don't ask me where this saying comes from, although somebody told me once, you know people will talk about pulling yourself up from your bootstraps, <laughs> which obviously is a very dated thing, because who has bootstraps anymore? I mean, it's going to be like a 19th century thing. But anyway, the idea of bootstrapping is like, I need something. I can't get this analytically. So I, you know, and the something here is going to be like confidence intervals and or standard errors. I think that there are other times that we bootstrap too. But, but most common reason for bootstrapping is because I, 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 I want standard errors or I want confidence intervals, but I I can't get them analytically. So I can just empirically derive my standard errors. So bootstrapping is a technique that gets used when you've got, like there is no, ob I mean, there's no sort of obvious solution, let's say. I wanna, I wanna know what the sampling variation is because the sampling variation, the sampling variance, right? The square root of the sampling variance is the standard error, right? So remember, Remember what the sampling variance is, right? If I, you know, I have some sort of parameter estimate, right? And what, what is that really, what is the sampling variance really telling me? It's telling me about, like, I have this parameter estimate. What sort of, what is this likely distribution, right, of parameter estimates, right? What's the likely distribution? So I can't, in the, you know, Right in the pop, I can't necessarily assume a certain distribution in a population. So what I can do is actually come up with a sampling distribution of parameter estimates, and I can use that. I can do that by basically computing I, I, using computational techniques instead of analytic techniques. So all of our standard error computations, they all assume a normal distribution. Right? I'm saying like, oh, if this is normally distributed, this is what this should look like in the popular, right? Blah, blah, blah. This is how much variability I expect around like this parameter estimate. You know, again, assuming a normal distribution, blah, 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 blah. But if I can't do that, then I, then I got to do something different. So what I can do is basically just come up with the sampling variance myself, and then I can use that to derive standard errors, confidence intervals, test hypotheses. And I can generate a standard error non-parametrically, which means I don't have to make any kinds of statistical assumptions. So I don't have to assume normality of, you know, uh, I don't have to assume, I don't have to assume the model's correct. Uh, I am, for regular bootstrapping, and again, this is an area of research right now, but for sort of garden variety bootstrapping, the one thing I am gonna assume is independence of observations. And you'll see why that's true when I talk about how this works. So here's what we do. Okay, I got my original sample, right? And I want to kind of know about what the distribution of parameter estimates might look like in the population. Because that's, that's really what the sampling variance <laughs> is kind of telling me about the variability in those parameter estimates. So what I'm going to do, because I don't, I don't have a formula now to be able to use, I'm gonna, I've got a sample of some sample size. So let's say I've got a thousand people in my sample. I'm going to take repeated samples 
of some sample size, and it really could be any sample size, but generally speaking, and the way that it'll work by default in M plus and lots of other software packages, is that they'll take a sample of the same size as your sample size. So like if you have a sample of a thousand people, it's going to repeatedly sample a thousand people. And here's the important thing. If you sampled a thousand people without replacement from your sample of a thousand, you would always get the same sample, right? But we're not going to do that. We're going to sample with replacement. So basically you've got a thousand people in your sample and I'm going to, what that means is I'm going to take, again, conceptually, right? It's not like the computer underneath is literally like drawing out of the hat, but we can think of it as like, you got the thousand people in a hat, right? And I, you know, I draw the first person and I say, this person goes in my sample. And then I throw that person back in the hat. That's what with replacement means, right? And then I draw another person and I put them over here. They're going to be the second person in my sample. And I throw that person back in the hat, right? And I do this and I do it a thousand times. So theoretically, super highly unlikely, but theoretically, you could, in fact, draw the same person a thousand times. Right? I mean, the probability that that happens is like so incredibly low, you know, that you should go buy a lottery ticket if that ever happens. And so, actually, they use some like pseudo randomization here, so I don't think it would even happen in M, but or most other stats packages. But like theoretically, with replacement, somebody could certainly end up in your sample a couple of times easily, right? So there could be some samples where one person shows up a couple of times or a few times in another sample where that same person never shows up at all, right? And, you know, so I do that and then I have my thousand person sample and then I actually like run the model with that sample, that new sample of people and I get parameter estimates, right? And I do this as, as many times as I decide to draw bootstrap samples. Well, you can't just do this once or twice because what we're trying to do is actually what we'll get. And this is kind of the cool thing is, let's say I do this, say I do this a few hundred times. So, uh, and actually, let's say I'm thinking about the indirect effect because that's the whole reason I'm doing this actually is because of the input. I can't get a good estimate of the standard error for the indirect effect. So let's say I'm thinking about, I'm really thinking about like, I really want to kind of drill down on this A times B path, right? This product of A times B, my indirect effect. So I'm going to get an estimate of my indirect effect for the first sample, let's say, right? Let's say A times B is, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but and then I get an estimate for my second sample, and I get an estimate for my third sample, and so on and so forth. And eventually, I'm going to actually get a, a distribution. I made that look kind of normal, but let's make it look a little less normal, let's say. I'm going to get a distribution of estimates of my A times B path for all of these different 500 bootstrap draws. Right? And so I then, if I, you know, again, I have no way to get a standard error really, but I mean, analytically, but remembering that the sampling variance is really, again, the variance in the, it's like the variance in the parameter estimates, right? That we would sort of expect. So if I do this, I could figure out what's the variance in this distribution. And the variance in this distribution is my empirical estimate of the sampling variance. Does that make sense? Because I basically, instead of using normal theory to say, this is what the variance in the parameter estimate should be, I'm just using my sample, pretending like it's the population, sampling with replacement a whole slew of times, getting the distribution, and then the variance of this distribution is the sampling variance. And the square root of the sampling variance is the standard error. With me so far? Yeah? But here's the thing. If I get a standard error, right, then I could, then I could take A times B and I could divide it, right, by the standard error. And I could get some sort of a test statistic. Or I could take A times B plus or minus 1.96 
times the standard error to get a confidence interval. But there's still a problem with both of those things. What is it? Well, I think it's more obvious when you look at the confidence interval formula. Assuming a normal distribution? Yeah, it's assuming a symmetric distribution. It's assuming a, like a normal and symmetric distribution. But I just said here, like, maybe it won't be, right? That was like the whole point. That's the whole reason that I went to bootstrapping was like, yeah, maybe actually this distribution of this A times B product might not actually be normal. So if it's not normal, it doesn't actually make sense to really do either of these things. But what could I do? I can empirically derive the confidence interval, right? So how do I do that? Well, that's really easy. I've got this distribution, right? And so I could say, let's say I want the 95% confidence interval. I could be like, okay, I've got two and a half percent out here, right? I got two and a half percent out here. And then wherever these right, thresholds are, that's going to give me the 95% confidence interval. So I can empirically derive the 95% confidence interval. And if I'm empirically deriving the 95% confidence interval, then it doesn't really matter whether I have, uh, you know, whether I actually have um, a symmetric distribution or not. So what are you reporting? Like how, how do you do the reporting side of this? So, What's it, it's not going to look that different, but what you're, you're really just going to be using bootstrapping to do this. But the one, I guess the one thing that is going to be different is we're going to use the bootstrapped confidence interval to evaluate the indirect effect. And it turns out that like for all of the other parameters in our model, if we're just looking at the direct effect, if we're just looking at like the, you know, just the regular old parameter estimates that we were looking at thus far, that we don't have to worry. Like we can still use regular old maximum likelihood to get those, you know, standard error to get those estimates, to get those standard errors to evaluate things. But where we really need to bootstrap is if I want to be able to evaluate this product, this A, which we haven't done before, right? I mean, so I want to evaluate whether this is different from zero. And if I want to evaluate whether this is different from zero, then what I'm going to do is basically bootstrap everything. And then I'm going to get confidence intervals for this A times B indirect effect. And I'm going to use the same logic that I do with statistical significance tests or what, you know, what I do with confidence intervals regularly, which is if the confidence interval contains zero, then I'm going to say, okay, well, that's basically zero, right? And if the confidence interval doesn't contain zero, then I'm going to say, right, that zero is not in this confidence interval, so it looks like this indirect effect isn't zero. So basically, I'm going to do the exact same thing that I normally do, except for, and this is important, like, because you will get bootstrap standard errors. Instead of using the bootstrap standard errors, I'm really going to zoom in on the bootstrap confidence interval. Yeah? Now, one little tricky thing here is that because I'm really interested in sort of the confidence interval, like, so I'm really looking out on the tails of this distribution, it's going to matter how many bootstrap samples I have. So, like, if I wanted to bootstrap estimates and just sort of get a good estimate of, like, you know, the median or something, right, like, that, that's kind of easy. There's lots of, like, data right in there. But because the confidence intervals were out on the tails of the distribution, you have to do enough bootstrap samples to have like enough samples to actually fill in out here to get like a good stable estimate of where the 2.5th percentile is and to get a good stable estimate of where the 97.5th percentile is, right? Um, and in fact, you know, if you wanted a 99% confidence interval, you would need more bootstrap samples than if you needed than, than if you wanted the 95% confidence interval, because now you'd really be like way out on the tails. And you need to make sure you've got like enough cases out here to get a good estimate of where where this cut point should be for the confidence interval. Does that make sense? 
So like, so how many of these bootstrap samples should we draw? Well, you know, the old, basically rock bottom minimum is 2000 for, uh, you know, for deriving confidence intervals, like 95% confidence intervals. I'd, I'd argue more, way more than 2000 for 99% confidence intervals probably. Um, you know, so you always want to use at least 2000. This all happens super fast. So there's really not a downside to going higher. We could go 10,000, we could go 20,000, we could go 50,000. At a certain point, like, you're not really going to be, you know, there's, there's going to be sort of a, a diminishing returns in terms of, you know, how many bootstrap samples are useful. What, where the bootstrap samples are useful is really just sort of filling in what this distribution looks like. Right. And again, if we really are trying to kind of get a good estimate of a threshold on the tail, that's why we want to have a, a lot of bootstrap samples. If we really just want to get a sort of an overall picture of what the distribution looks like, probably 500 or 1,000 samples would be plenty. But because we really are zooming in on the confidence intervals, we're going to jack up the number of bootstrap samples. So I would say minimally 2,000. I mean, I tend to honestly, in my own work, use at least five or 10,000. Um, it doesn't take all that long. So you'll see it's not a big deal. Uh, okay, so I already said all of that. Um, yeah, I think I've said pretty much all of this. So basically, right, we're, we're just saying the sample is your best estimate of the population. And so, you know, we're sort of assuming that the behavior of the statistic when it's applied to samples from the sample is going to be analogous to its behavior when it's applied to samples from the original population. That's kind of like the logic of it. Um, so, you know, when we bootstrap, we're always going to bootstrap when we need to get standard errors or confidence intervals for sort of non-normal data or maybe if we're not meeting some particular statistical assumptions, or if you can't analytically derive the standard error. Um, and so this is really commonly used to get these, again, I should say, again, I'm saying correct standard errors, but we're really going to use the confidence intervals in our mediational models. Uh, can be useful when you have a small sample size, although it doesn't really solve problems with incredibly low sample sizes. So be cautious of that. And we do, there are other types of techniques that we use to bootstrap. So um, low mendel rubin bootstraps and bootstrap likelihood ratio tests are both examples of um, sort of statistic, they're sort of um, statistical tests that use bootstrapping. So we're not going to talk about those today. So I really did get ahead of my slides here. So you can see, here's my pretty picture of the, you know, 90% confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval and the 99% confidence interval. And really what I'm trying to get at here is that, you know, you really, as you're going out on the tails, you really need more bootstrap samples to be able to fill in that distribution so you can get a good sense of really where this cut point is. <laughs> but just remember that increasing the number of bootstrap samples doesn't actually give you any more information from your original data set, you know? Um, so how do we get these bootstrap confidence intervals? It's literally what I just said. We just, we just, the percentile method is just, you know, we take the, we just, we just empirically say, okay, where's the, where's the two and a half percentile? Where's the 97.5th percentile? And then those become, that becomes the lower bound and the upper bound for our confidence interval. And we compute it that way. By the way, M plus is going to give you these. You don't actually have to compute them. But, but that's how it works. There's also something called an, you know, bias corrected bootstrap um, confidence interval. So the bias corrected estimates take into account the skewness of the bootstrap distribution. Um, and, you know, there's really, really mixed messaging on bias corrected bootstrap standard error, uh, bootstrap confidence intervals. So, um, we're going to use the bias corrected bootstrap confidence intervals, and I think I tell you to use those for your homework. But but I will say that you know this is an area where like you know it just in the last year even as I went back to the research, there's um, there's been some recent research just in the last year suggesting that the bias corrected bootstrap 
performs less well than the uncorrected uh, percentile method, at least in some cases. So, I mean, this is sort of an area for, for, for research. I mean, one thing, again, if it's your own data, so for the homework, just use the bias corrected bootstrap. Generally speaking, you're not gonna see much of a difference. Uh, this is another case where if I were doing this with my own data, given sort of the state of the art, I would run my bootstrap, I would run it both ways. And what you should see is negligible differences between the bias corrected bootstrap and the regular bootstrap method. And if you're getting something that's very similar, either way, then you kind of don't have to worry too much. If you're finding different results with the bias corrected and the percentile method, then yeah, then I'd be like, okay, which one am I gonna use? Uh, the good news is you could find research literature to support either way, because literally there are papers that say you should use the bias corrected and more recent papers now that are saying, well, maybe, maybe not, right? So for a long time, everybody said bias corrected are better. Now suddenly people are like, yeah, maybe not. So for homework, just use bias corrected, but in your own work, you probably want to think a little more, a, a little more deeply, but again, run it both ways. 99% of the time, it's not going to matter. If it does matter, it's probably, you know, the, it's worth doing some detective work to see if you can figure out why it matters. Yeah. Um, so you said you use it with non-normal distributions. Is there anything in M plus that gives you estimates of those, or do you need to run that in another package? Well, yeah, in M plus, actually, you do get some indication for the variables in your model of students and kurtosis, right? You get that little, you've probably seen it. There's like a little, a little, it's kind of ugly, but there's a little table that tells you what like the mean and the median and the skewness and kurtosis are. But I mean, obviously, and I guess I should have said this earlier, but you know, I'm really focused on how to run all these things in SEM, but like you would not just take a data set and dive right into everything we're doing. You would obviously want to screen and clean your data and get to know your data and check for out, like, right? There's a lot of sort of pre-work that needs to go on. I'm not talking about p-hacking or phishing. I'm just talking about like, you know, exploring what the univariate and multivariate distributions look like. Do you have outliers? Are things coded correctly, right? Does stuff make sense before you kind of ever get into actually doing stuff in M plus. So yeah, you can, there is some normality information in the M plus output, but you can certainly get far more information from like a general purpose software package. Um, there are other kinds of bootstraps. We're just going to use this, you know, sort of the regular old bootstrap. Um, the smooth bootstrap actually blows in a little small amount of random noise. The parametric bootstrap, now this is actually something that is, this is important. Um, in the parametric bootstrap, you sort of, you fit the parametric model to the data, and then you actually, um, and then you actually sort of create bootstrap estimates from there. Um, and this, this might sound really weird, but the, the place where this actually comes into play is like, if you don't actually have raw data, so you can't actually draw, like you can't, you can't draw bootstrap samples. So the parametric bootstrap is actually going to use the variance, you know, like you run the model using the variance covariance matrix, and then you'll actually, then you'll actually sort of you know, use some, some parametric techniques to actually generate bootstrap samples from that to be able to bootstrap. Um, so that's sort of the big thing about that. It's like the parametric bootstrap is something you can use if you don't have raw data. Uh, and then resampling residuals is another way of sort of bootstrapping that really focuses on the, the residuals. Um, so, you know, bootstrapping is great, gives you a good, you know, better way to get a standard error, and certainly, most importantly, the confidence interval for an estimator. But bootstrapping itself, by itself, doesn't necessarily, you know, produce a better estimator, generate more information about the population, cure, cure all your sampling problems, or convert bad data into good data, right? So it's not a panacea for all bad things with your data. It sort of solves a very specific kind of problem. Um, you know, Bootstrapping assumes your original sample is representative of the population. That's probably one of the biggest assumptions that we never meet. It does assume independence, 
Uh, and this is interesting. If your data are actually multivariately normally distributed, there's some evidence to suggest that the bootstrap, um, the bootstrap standard errors could actually be more biased than the standard maximum likelihood estimates. So if you were thinking to yourself, why don't we just bootstrap everything all the time? That's, that's besides the fact that it can be cumbersome, that's another reason. So, you know, if we have reason to believe we're not meeting multivariate normality, bootstrapping could be a good solution. But if things are good, then you might actually then you might actually be better off just using your regular old parameter estimates. And um, you know, if you're going to do latent variable modeling, you should use the marker variable strategy here. And like you know, sometimes it, you know again, like everything else that we talk about, sometimes it's you know maybe it's not going to work. All right. So how are we going to actually get the indirect effects in M plus? We're not. I mean. We could, I guess, take our path coefficients and multiply them by each other, but to get an estimate of the indirect effect, but that wouldn't work for the standard errors and the confidence intervals, right? We need actually to tell M plus that we're interested in the direct, indirect, and total effects. So we're going to use a new command called model indirect. So this is going to be like model indirect colon, and they'll come after your model command. Um, and we can actually use this to tell M plus which indirect effects we're interested in examining. So um, let me show you what it looks like. Okay, so IND is going to be the command and we're going to say, we'll, we'll give a variable on the left hand side of the IND that's going to be the dependent variable. So for example, here with like X, M, and Y. So we would say like Y, I, and D. Um, and then we would say that sort of like the last variable on the right-hand side is going to be the independent variable. So that's going to be X. And then the mediator goes in the middle. So like Y, well, actually, you can say something else. I could, I could just say why I, so I'd have model indirect colon, and then I'd say y i and d x. And if I haven't put the mediators in, then it's actually going to give me all of the potential indirect pathways between y, you know, all the indirect y, pathways between x and y. And it'll give me specific indirect effects that go through a particular variable, and then it'll give me total indirect effects that are sort of, it's like the sum of all of the indirect effects of all of the potential mediational variables, which you'll see in a second. Um, so that's what I'm saying. If there are no mediating variables, then all indirect effects are, are going to be computed and included. So that's great. You can just write that. But like, if you said this, y, i, n, d, m, Effects, then it's going to give you all of the indirect effects from, you know, so all of this sort of, you know, indirect effects from X to Y that go sort of via, right, where M is the mediator. So if you had a model like this, let me just, so let's say you had this. Let's say this is M and then this is, I don't know. C. I'll say this is C. Okay, so this is my, oops, that's a mediation model. Okay, so, I, so now I've got two mediators, right? M and C. So if I say I, Y, I, and D, X, I'm going to get the indirect effects from X to M to Y, the indirect effect from X to C to Y, and then the total indirect effect will be actually the sum of the indirect effect that goes through M, plus the indirect effect that goes through C. So that would tell you like the entire, the totality of indirect effects from X to Y via either of these two variables. If I write that. If I write this, it's only gonna give me the indirect effect from X to M to Y. It's not gonna give me anything about this. There's really not, I mean, to be honest, I mean, again, you could probably think of an example where you would rather do it this way but for the most part, I mean, generally speaking, 
there's really not a big downside to just saying y indirect x because it is going to give you both the broken out via m and c and the total indirect effect through everything. So, you know, like the vast majority of the time, you know, you're going to use something like this. There could be a situation, though, where let's say you really did want to zoom in on a particular part of the model, right? Like, especially like maybe you had something like this, you know, and so maybe you don't even, I don't know, maybe that's not a good example, but if, if you wanted to zoom in on it, a, maybe you just want to look at, you know, some little aspect, you can, you can use this scenario of like saying, I just want to look at all the ones that go through this one loop or something. Yeah. So if you were to like have both, would that mess up? Impossibility for limits. Like, oh, you mean if you had y i n d x and y i n d m x yeah. like that? I think it'll run okay. Actually, this is an interesting question, but I don't, I don't think it'll mess it up. But you'll know if it does, right? But I, yeah, I think that would run okay. Um, okay, so that, so so an m plus is going to report out. The indirect of each of these specific indirect effects. And then it's also going to give you the total indirect effect. And then finally, it's going to give you the total effect, which would be the direct effect plus the total of the indirect effect. Right? And for any, for any uh, parameter estimate that has the indirect effect in it, you would want to use the bootstrap confidence interval. So when you're looking at the total effects or the indirect effects, you really want to use the bootstrap confidence interval. But if you're looking at the direct effects, which are just like the things that we've normally been looking at, just the regular old beta coefficients or the or the Bs, right? The the you know regression coefficients. For those, you don't need to use the bootstrap standard errors or the bootstrap confidence intervals. You can just use the regular old estimates. If there's so for direct effects. You know, you're fine. It's really when you're looking at anything that has the indirect effect in it that you want to use these bootstrap confidence intervals. Okay. There's also, I know, I don't know. Uh, so there are also is this thing called VIA, which is, a, you know, very much like IND. So the variable on the left hand side of VIA is the dependent variable, the last variable on the right hand side is the independent variable. And all the other variables on the right hand side of the via are the mediating variables. Um, and, you know, so again, it just sort of computes all the indirect effects that go through with via. So, you know, I feel like you can generally, most of the time, get the same thing from IMD specifying your, you know, your mediating variables as you can with via. So I tend to use I IMD, but I'll just mention it there that via is an option. So here's some simple mediation code. So um, via is just different in that um, in, on the left side you have, or in direct, you have the independent um, variable, but um, the via statement, we have the direct um, variable on the left side. Or they are both the same. They're both the same. Yeah. Here. Oops, let me go back. In both cases, the dependent variable of the indirect effect is always on the left hand side. So they look very, they look very similar. And in fact, in lots of cases, you could write the same code using IND or VIA and you'll get the same result. I'm hard pressed to think of a good example of where you need VIA, but you can't accomplish it with IND. I'm quite sure there are occasionally cases, but for most of the time, it's, it's not the case. So I just mentioned that that's another option, uh, but you know, we can just stick with IND, it's fine. Um, or, well, this is actually a little bit more complex. Okay, so we can um, we can say model indirect, right? We've got bootstrap is 5,000. Actually, I should have, like, this is more complex, right? But we've got, uh, okay, well, actually, this should be, that's the problem we've got. That's the description. I was going to say, that is really bad looking. So this via is the is actually me telling you this, but it got wrapped around. So the actual code is right there. That's really bad. 
There you go. So the code is just y i n d m x, which is the indirect effect of x on y through f. And then for output, this is important. This is a new thing we're going to need to say in our output. You're not going to get confidence intervals unless you ask for them, even if you say bootstrap. So for analysis, oh yeah, I should have pointed that out. So for analysis, we're going to say bootstrap. Bootstrap is 5,000. That just tells the number of bootstrap samples. So we need to say bootstrap. And then for output, we need to say C interval to get our, ourselves confidence intervals. And if you say C interval, BC bootstrap, you'll get the bias corrected bootstrap confidence intervals. If you say C interval bootstrap without the BC in front, you'll just get the percentile method bootstrap. Um, so, you know, to request the bias corrected bootstrap, you just say BC bootstrap. Uh, so again, you know, you want bootstrap plus confidence interval to get those confidence intervals. And so, and you want the model indirect to tell it which indirect effects you want. So really you need to have that bootstrap statement, the model indirect statement and the confidence interval statement in your code. So bootstrap goes in analysis to tell it how many bootstrap samples model indirect you're telling it what indirect effects you want it to actually estimate, right? And then confidence interval is to get the confidence intervals in your output. And by the way, this C interval will work for any models. Now, we haven't traditionally been asking for confidence intervals, but uh, just because, you know, I don't know, just because we haven't. But this will work even when you're not doing bootstrapping, just asking for C interval in your output will give you confidence intervals. All right. So, I mean, I think we've said all of that. It's pretty, pretty obvious. Um, okay, so uh, there are lots of other issues in mediation. How do we deal with categorical mediators? Oh, that's a big one. You know, mediation and moderation we'll touch upon a little bit later in the semester. How do we deal with mediation in a multi-level framework? Okay, that's a big topic that we are not gonna tackle here. Causal mediation. Great topic, also not going to tackle here. Um, and then we're not going to do this today, but I'll just mention that if you want to specify an indirect effect where there's moderation, you can use model indirect as a mod statement. So um, this is a way that you can actually you know, look at moderation and mediation simultaneously. We will come back to moderation later in the semester. So I'm not going to talk about that too much. Lots of mediation references. Okay, good. So let's close this out and I don't want to save anything. Let's go to our M plus. So, oh, let me start by saying, I am not going to walk us through the all of the steps of model building that we would normally go through. We are jumping to the final model, but like to put this final model together, of course, we would do a measurement model and we would do, we would look at the conceptually omitted paths using the just identified structural model. Then we'd look at the conceptual model with the conceptually omitted paths included. I would do all of those steps. This is me. You need to change your mind. You can do it differently if you want. But personally, I would do all of those steps not using bootstrapping. Because as I'm doing all of those steps, I'm not really zooming in on trying to look at the test of statistical significance or the confidence intervals for my those indirect and total effects, right? I'm doing this model building, but I'm kind of waiting till the end to kind of look at what I've got and interpret my model. So until I'm looking at what I've got and interpreting my model, well, obviously for the measurement model, there aren't going to be any indirect effects, right? Because that's obvious. But even with the just identified model, yes, it's true, right? It's a complicated model. It's got indirect effects, but uh, you know, when I'm doing those steps, I'm not actually looking at, I'm not actually looking at interpreting whether the indirect effects are zero or not, right? It's not until I get to my final model that I really want to evaluate that question. And so there's really no reason to put bootstrapping in until I get to the end. So that's one of the reasons that we're jumping to the end. The other reason is, and one of the reasons I would recommend you not put bootstrapping in until the end is that even though it goes fast, it does add time. And you'll see that, like, especially if we combine this with some other types of techniques that we might use later on, 
Um, like, could you, oh my God, if you do like multiple mutation and bootstrapping, although that's not something you can do always. Like, but like, you know, if you if you start combining things that are time consuming together, uh, you know, it can get really, it can get cumbersome, right? Because you're like doing all these replications. So we're gonna wait till the end, run our final model with the bootstrapping, and then evaluate. So did everybody get? Did everybody get one of these? Okay. So, so this is our model. It's kind of a dumb little model. Sure, absolutely. Anybody else need one? It's the same one up there. Yeah, same one up there. I hope so. Yeah, it should be. Um, so let me just talk really briefly, not too briefly. I'm not going to talk briefly because it's 12.05. Really briefly. So what we've got here is uh, cognitive ability and pre- like math achievement, are predicting how people do on pre and post unit tests. And then those, how people do on the post unit test is predicting how they do on uh, standardized math, two standardized math achievement tests. And the sort of the interesting, I mean, it's not a, you know, it's not a great model or whatever, but uh, it, it, the kind of an interesting thing is this idea of like, yeah, it does how kids do on these unit tests, does that actually mediate the effect of cognitive ability and prior achievement on their subsequent achievement? So that's kind of like the logic of the model. But because we're running out of time, I'm not going to belabor that point. All right, so if you go to week six in the courses folder, you should see M plus mediation bootstrapping and I'm going to open up M plus somewhere. There it is. And we're going to use the one that is called, okay, open, look at bootstrap, bootstrapping Betsy.imp. It's the 01, sorry, 01 bootstrapping. I think that's the one that should be in there for you. And we have this bootstrapping example. So the model, the model is set up exactly the way that it looks on this first sheet. Uh, there's really nothing tricky about the model setup. So I will sort of focus on this model indirect. So here we go. So I want to, I mean, I want to estimate, you know, the indirect effect of the pre-unit test on me. I want to, and, and so here, notice NAEP is like one of those outcome variables. And the pre-unit test isn't actually, isn't actually like the sort of earliest predictor. Notice that it's like cognitive ability and pre-achievement predict pre-unit, and then pre-unit predicts post-unit, and post-unit predicts NAEP. And, but I can do that here. Like, I want to know what's the indirect effect of the pre-unit test on um, on NAEP, which would be going through the post-unit test. So you don't necessarily, see what I'm saying? Like, you don't necessarily have to start. You could look at, like, little pieces of indirect effects that don't necessarily go all the way from, like, these variables to these variables. I have that. I have, like, what's the indirect effect of, like, you know, what are the indirect effects of IQ on NAEP? Right, so here's IQ on NAEP, but then I also have like, what's the indirect effect of pre-unit on NAEP? Oh, no, which one's NAEP? On NAEP, which obviously, in some sense, I mean, again, these are not completely independent of each other, right? But I want to be able to evaluate these different types of indirect effects, so I can just specify all the different indirect effects that I think I might be interested in. And I probably went over to them here because you know we're just showing indirect effects, but. And that's how I specify them. So that's pretty easy. Then I want to make sure that I say confidence interval, you know, here bias corrected bootstrap. Um, if it's not already in your thing, put plot colon type equals plot three. This will actually allow us to see the distribution of the um, indirect, you know, that, that AB product. Um, and then uh, you know, up here I have an analysis, bootstrap equals 2,500, just to keep it kind of short because we've got not that much time left. Okay, so I'm going to click on run, and there it goes.
plot, it's plot, uh, plot colon, because plot is a main command, and then it says uh, type equals plot three without any space. And that's something I added this morning that I decided, okay. So here are my results. So here's where I was talking about, you get some information about the mean variance, skewness, kurtosis, that always comes out when you were asking about normality. Okay, so here we go. I've got my, you know, fit. I'm not gonna worry about my fit right now. And I've got my unstandardized and my standardized estimates and my R squares. So everything there is, you know, just like we would have seen before. So let's really look at what we get that's different. Oh wait, I should make this bigger, right? Uh, view, no, edit, change font. Twenty, maybe. Oh yeah, that's nice. Okay, there we go. So nothing that nothing in the first several pages is any different from anything we've seen before. So let's kind of jump down to the total total indirect, specific indirect, and direct effects. And again, the direct effects are going to be on here, but the direct effects already show up in the prior output because the direct effects are just like our path coefficients, right? So we're not it's like we don't really need this just to get you know direct effect stuff. Now let's go ahead and just look at our standardized estimates. You'll, we'll get these as standardized and unstandardized. I think it's easier to look at the standardized here, especially because you don't know anything about the metrics, right? So here are my, and, and everything here is continuous. So we're looking at STDYX. So here are my standardized total, total indirect, specific indirect and direct effects. So here we've got the effect from like uh, pre, Actually, let's look at, let's go IQ to NAEP because we only have a few minutes left. Effect from IQ to NAEP, here we go. So the total indirect effect from IQ to NAEP, notice that here it's actually the same as the specific indirect effect because there is actually only one like indirect pathway from IQ to NAEP. And it tells me what the pathway is starting with the dependent variable working back to the independent variable. So let's, I'll start at the bottom and work my way up. So this in specific indirect path is IQ predicts pre-unit, pre-unit predicts post-unit, post-unit predicts NAEP. So that's, so it's like IQ to pre-unit, pre-unit to post-unit, post-unit to NAEP, and that specific indirect effect would actually be like A times B times C times Q, right? Follow? Okay. So that is 0.48. That is actually the only indirect effect that goes all the way from IQ to NAEP. You can confirm that on the drawing, but I can also see that because see, the total indirect effect here is actually the same as the specific indirect effect. If there were two different ways to kind of go from there to there, right? The way that I stuff, then I would actually, then those wouldn't be the same. Like you'd have it, you know, they, they, would, they would get added together. And this is a bad example in some sense because I don't think we have any examples where the total indirect is different from the specific indirect. What were you going to say, Faez? Um, here there is actually a direct effect um, because it says the direct effect from IQ to me. Oh, yeah, I didn't say there wasn't a direct effect. I was just talking about the indirect effect. The direct effect we always get. The direct effect is just the path coefficient, right? So I don't really need to even think about the boot. I don't really need the bootstrap confidence interval for the direct effect. <coughs> like I could just use the regular old standard error for the direct effect. No, but my point is that why the total, sorry, sorry. The total effect is the direct effect plus the total indirect effect. 0.155 plus 0.48 equals 0.635, right? So the total effect is always going to be the direct effect plus the total indirect effect. And we might have different specific indirect effects if there are different sort of specific indirect effects that get totaled together for the total indirect effect. But what I'm saying here is you can see that the specific indirect effect and the total indirect effect are the same. So there's just that one sort of this to this to this to this, right? 
All right, now what I get here, I get some sort of, I get like standard errors and what well, I get all kinds of stuff, but I really want to look at, so I get all of that, that's nice, but really where I want to go down to evaluate is where it says the confidence intervals of the model results. And again, I'm going to go down to the standardized ones. Zoop, zoop, zoop. So the confidence intervals of the standardized model results. Because remember I said, so like that, this is really where I'm going to get the bias corrected bootstrap confidence intervals, which is really what I trust for evaluating the indirect effect. So the first thing I get are all my direct effects, which, you know, okay, fine. And then I get, there we go. Now I get my confidence intervals. Oops, those are not the standardized. Let's jump down to the standardized. Confidence intervals of the standardized total, total indirect, specific indirect, and direct effects. So let's look at IQ to, uh, what were we looking at? Now I forget. Okay. Were we not looking at the standardized before? I know, but I'm just looking at, we got really different. Hold on. TBS pre to name. Okay. So anyway, confident. Oh, oh, because I'm throwing myself off because the first number isn't the parameter estimate. It's the lower bound of like the 99% confidence interval. I was like, that is not the same number, but this is, you got to go back up here. It's the lower 0.5%, lower 2.5%, lower 5% estimate. So actually, it's the estimate is in the middle. And then we want to look at the second and second to last number. So let's go back there. Specific indirect effect. Here we go. IQ to Nate. So here are the numbers right here. I do that all the time, by the way, when I look at this output at first. I'm like, what? What's that 0.5? That's not right. But no, it, it is right. It's just not the number I'm used to seeing in the left-hand column. So... My total effect is 0.635. If I want to compute the 95% confidence interval, that goes from 0.53 to 0.741. The total indirect effect we said was 0.48. The 95% confidence interval for that is from 0.356 to 0.631. Again, you just have to kind of go back up and look at what the columns are telling you. Um, and you can see that in e both of those cases, zero is not in the 95% confidence interval. So that indirect effect is statistically significantly different from zero, right? That total indirect effect is, is obviously not zero, not even close, right? And again, I get, I get all of this for like the direct effect, but I don't really need it for the direct effect. What's interesting here is like, you know, here's the direct effect and you can see the 95% confidence interval for the direct effect actually does include zero. Um, but again, you know, I don't necessarily need to bootstrap the confidence intervals for the direct effect. Okay, questions about any of this? Does it make sense? Maybe, kind of? So because the direct effect includes zero, um, can we say that um, the direct effect isn't significant? Yeah, yeah, because the, because the 95% confidence interval for the direct effect includes zero, then, then we would com would conclude that it's not statistically significantly different from zero. If you're using the bias corrected bootstrap confidence interval, I mean, one thing I would kind of want to go back is, is just also look at the regular old ML standard error and see if that's also giving you the same, the same evaluation, um, which I suspect that it is. I wouldn't expect it to be different, to be honest. But yeah. Did you set one of the correlations to be zero for something that's related to this concept or just? No, that's a good point. I did not do it for a related reason, but it is true that in this, uh, in this input, I did set the correlation between the disturbances of NAEP and ITBS post to be zero. And I'm gonna be honest with you, not totally sure why M plus is gives me that correlation by default in this particular example, because I've definitely run other examples where you don't by default get correlated disturbance terms. 
So I'm kind of befuddled by that, but for whatever reason in this model, it does. So then I just constrained it to be equal to zero because it wasn't in the final model. I had the same issue with one of my models, and I saw on the forum that's on the M plus discussion, and the developers answered that the reason is that whenever we have endogenous variables that don't predict any other variables, then oh, is that by true? default, you should get um, the the correlation between the disturbances of the endogenous variables. That's as long as they are as long as they aren't predicting anything else. That makes sense, actually. So, uh, which is interesting. I think that's a relatively new, I don't know if it was always the default, but anyway, be that as it may, that makes total sense. So I didn't want that. I didn't want that correlation between the disturbances. So I actually specified it to be zero by default. And you can always do that. And you should always check. I mean, it's defaults can be tricky uh, to know what everything is, but the most important thing is that you look at your model and make sure the model is specified the way you want it to. And if for some reason there's a default that you don't want, then you can always, you know, it's really easy to override anything. So like I can say, I don't want that residual covariance, so I just set it at zero. I think I also have another example in that in that uh, input where I, you know, I say like I do want the correlation between the two exogenous variables, right? If for some reason that, you know, you can always you can always sort of override any of the default specifications by just sort of specifying in the model explicitly what you want. So that is good to know what the defaults are though. That's interesting. I did not realize it's really interesting. I would swear that that has not always been the case or that I have examples where it isn't the case when they're but anyway that's fine. Yeah, that the is rationale in there. was that um, if the disturbances of such variables are not correlated then yes. it's highly likely that the model is consistent. I mean, it does make sense to correlate those disturbances. It, it does. I can see the logic for it. It's just, it's just interesting. It's interesting that it's a very, it's an odd, it's an odd rule, right? Because it's not always, it's fine. Anyway, I will let people go because you don't want to see me ponder this. You want to go to your next class. So let me stop this and just note that like just about everything in this homework other than the model indirect stuff is really very similar to what you've already done, right? So that's really where things are, you know, it's really about these indirect effects and getting good estimates of the confidence